Good evening and welcome to the Lompoc City Council meeting. This is Tuesday, December 4th, 2018. It is 6.30 p.m. Madam Clerk, could we have roll call, please? Council Member Vega. Here. Council Member Starbuck. Present. Council Member Mosby. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Janelle Osborne. Here. And Mayor Bob Lingle. Here. Um, I see. Invocation. Please stand and Mr. Mayor, move your Mr. Hats. Mayor, I'm sorry. You want to report on closed session? Yes, I will do that. Reports taken in closed session. Thank you. Okay. Um, we had uh, two items on the agenda. One was an evaluation of our city manager, and I'm happy to say that uh, city manager, for the time he's been here, has been given an extremely um, commendable evaluation. Thank you, Mr. Troop. And uh, the other item, there is nothing to report. Is that true? And now you'll please stand, remove your hats if you're wearing one, and join Pastor Puntar in a invocation. Good evening. If you would bow your head in prayer. Oh God, as the seasons change and the weather gets colder, I pray for warmth. Let us come together as a community and share the warmth of hope and connection. Let us allow the frost of isolation and bitterness melt away. We extend our thoughts to all those who are cold this night, lacking shelter or love to keep them warm. We pray for all those impacted by the wildfires throughout our state. We pray for those who have lost loved ones, who have lost their homes, who have lost their communities. We pray for the rain tonight and ahead that further damage and destruction of life and property not happen, but that the rain restores and helps. This night we pray for our mayor, for our city council, for this assembled group. We ask, O oh God, that you would graciously grant the city council wisdom to govern amid the conflicting interests and issues, a sense of the welfare and true needs of the people of Lompoc, a keen thirst for justice and rightness, and a concern for those who do not have a voice. I also pray for personal peace in their lives and joy in their tasks. I pray for the agenda set before them today. Please give an assurance of what would benefit those who live and work in and around our city of Lompoc and in the beauty of, of the Central California coast. Help us all to work together to build communities that sustain and enhance life. And in this month when many celebrate the peace and the joy that you bring, let us remember those who struggle and hurt and use us to lift the burden of another and to be peacemakers and bridge builders. May peace and joy and love abound in our homes, throughout our community, and in our hearts. Amen. Amen. Please remain standing and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please have a seat. Mr. Fink, would you come forward, please? Good evening. Good, good to see you. So you may or may not know that uh, Mr. Fink has retired from the Planning Commission. Uh, Ron has served the planning, the City of Lompoc and the Planning Commission for 18 years many of those years as the chair of the Planning Commission. He saw us through many events, big and small, and uh, he was more than up to the task on all of them. Uh, I think you served under, well, you're, most recently you were my, me, my appointee. Um, I believe one other mayor, my, uh, Mayor Siminski, was appointed to you, and was that just? Uh, and mayor Lynn. 
and Mayor Lynn, yeah. So under three, three mayors were appointed to the Planning Commission. So uh, very commendable. We're going to miss you. Yeah, but you did see us through a lot of issues, and I want to thank you for that. So I'd like to present you with this um, plaque. It says, uh, presented to Ron Fink in appreciation of 18 years of service and ded dedication to the city of Lompoc and its citizens as a member of the Planning Commission, August 15, 2000 to November 30th, 2018. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. I had about 12 pages of notes, but I lost them out there in the wind earlier. So <laughs> anyway, uh, it was an honor to serve the city for as long as I did. I appreciated uh, participating in government. And for all of you out there, if you ever have an opportunity to serve in the city government or anywhere else in government, take it. It's important. You can see why it takes so long for things to get done. And you can see why, in hindsight, People make mistakes, but when you're looking ahead, you can't really tell what's going to happen. The perfect example is the upcoming zoning ordinance. We worked on that for a couple of years. It might work and it might not work, but we won't know for another four or five years whether anybody takes advantage of this or not. So anyway, if you have an opportunity to serve, please do. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, City Council. Thank you, Ron. Okay, another presentation. We have a presentation from the Lompoc Chamber of Commerce. Good evening, Council. I think I have a PowerPoint. I mean, I know I have a PowerPoint. I just don't see it. everybody doing? So I am here this evening. I'm Anna Wilson, President and CEO for the Lompoc Valley Chamber, and I am here tonight to present our biannual report for the period of January to June 2018. So um, you guys should all have the report in front of you. So here are some statistics to highlight. So this is our visitor traffic information. Uh, the number of walk-ins in that period was 1,470, which was up 150 from the same reporting cycle last year. The calls were 990, which are up 70 from the same reporting period last year. And then below highlights the visitor and relocation packets that were distributed. Some website analytics. These are the top five countries that look into Lompoc. So if anyone out there is considering some destination marketing, these might be the countries that you target. It's good that the USA is always first. And these are the top five pages that were visited in a comparison um, from 2017 to 2018. Um, I wanted to highlight that restaurant week jumped up considerably from year to year, the same reporting cycle. Um, we've really been ramping up our social media presence. We did some creative things with video on Instagram and Facebook. So I think that um, helped with that jump there. Top five downloads, our flower tour map is always a big hit. 
This helps us determine which publications we need to continue to produce for the community. And then our social media, you'll see that our Facebook likes are continually increasing month on month through increased social media efforts. And then to highlight some chamber activities during this period, SIP Lompoc, which is hosted, hosted by our Hispanic Business Committee, happens in May and also in November, so twice annually. For $40, you get to purchase a ticket, which gets you some tastings at participating wineries and some good swag, and it's an event that um, is popular in the community. Understand that November's event, which happens on Black Friday, was successful as well. So good for the Hispanic Business Committee. They actually raise money for youth scholarships. Our Old Town Market launched June 29th to August 10th. It was seven Fridays in Old Town. Um, the only evening that was actually in this reporting cycle was the first evening, which was the LHS Alumni Car Cruise. And feedback from the alumni was that they had one of the best turnouts ever and attendance was up from previous years, so they were really pleased. We did sell out overall in the market five of seven nights, which is in excess of 100 spaces to vendors, food vendors, so it was a really great event. Our restaurant week, um, again, grew tremendously this last year as far as exposure. So the web page was visited over 7,000 times with 21 participating restaurants, which is up two from the prior year. Menus were downloaded from Lompoc.com over 30,000 times. So my question was, well, if it was only visited 7,000 times, where did that 30,000 number come from? So that person can go on there and visit the web page and download as many menus as they want. So that's why that number is so different. Um, it was a cross-industry event promoting both restaurants and wineries who worked together to create menu pairings. And then our restaurant week this year, or I'm sorry, in 2019 is going to be February 18th through the 24th, if you want to mark your calendars. Dance Lompoc um, is a Dancing with the Stars style event where we showcased these fantastic five celebrity dancers who individually raised money for charities of their choice. It was a sold out event exceeding 200 attendees and they raised and we raised a combination of $12,000 for five local charities. This was um, broadcast live on Facebook and was viewed over 2,000 times. We are looking for celebrity dancers, so if you know anyone um, or if you yourself think that you have what it takes, let me know. We hosted several Business Connection luncheons featuring Jeff Schaefer with Home for Good, a Reality of the Riverbed panel discussion, Lompoc and Santa Maria Chamber Joint State of Vandenberg Air Force Base, and of course the State of the City of Lompoc. And I did want to just highlight the reality of the riverbed. It's the first time that we've hosted something like this. Um, it was brought to my attention that there was a lot of misconception with the riverbed cleanup, and we wanted to provide an opportunity to educate the community on some of the challenges that law enforcement and the city were facing. So we started with two panelists and ended up surprisingly with six panelists on the day. So present on the day was um, Captain Deanna Clement, Officer Marcio, Maui, is that right? Calderon, Dinah Lockhart, the Deputy Director for Santa Barbara County Community Development Division, Chuck Madsen with Central Coast Treatment Center, Jeff Schaefer with Home for Good, and Emily Allen, the Director of Homeless and Veterans Impact with the United Way of Santa Barbara County. This was featured live on Facebook and was viewed over 4,500 times by the community with 255 reactions and discussions regarding the event. So we got a ton of really positive feedback and we felt like um, the community received a lot of valuable information from the event. Several of our members hosted After Hours Mixers, so Sunset Auto, Hilton Garden Inn, Events Mission Valley, Valley Haven Adult Day Program, and Lompoc Valley YMCA participated during this time. And then we graduated our 32nd year of Leadership Lompoc Valley, class of 2018, so congratulations to them. 
And then lastly this evening, upcoming is our Holly Jolly Jubilee that's happening on Saturday, this coming Saturday, December 8th in the Chamber of Commerce parking lot. We'll have craft vendors, games, letters to Santa. Santa makes an appearance at three o'clock. So it'll be a fun family event for everybody if you'd like to come out and join us. And thank you so much to the city of Lompoc for your continued support. And that's all I've got. Okay, any questions? I have a couple. Sure, Councilmember Vega. Amber, one of the concerns that I've heard as far as the Old Town Market, uh, the limited amount of days that we have there as far as the cost and anything, I think that probably with Lompoc, with the weather that we have, um, maybe you can tell me what the hardships are with us extending the Old Town Market for having a little bit more through, for, through August. So duration, you mean? Duration. Increased Friday evenings? Yes, ma'am. Well, our number one challenge is staff time. So the chamber, we're a staff of three. And so it's a lot of work for the three of us. So we typically plan it seven to eight weeks during the summer, depending on when school starts. We will normally stop it that week before school starts. Um, and then that's kind of when the, that's really the, it, what we would need to extend it is a big volunteer corps to I help gotcha. run it. I got you. So you it. need more, more people helping. Yeah, for sure. So that would be it. Okay, because I don't go to school anymore, so. All right. Get well, it? call me. We'll okay, put you to gotcha. work. And the other thing was a, a comment that we had. Uh, the atmosphere is really nice there. Um, so I commend all of you. I just think maybe music on both ends or some sort of an event on both ends on a steady basis would probably have people uh, come out a little bit more if, if possible. I just okay. thought I'd say, okay, sometimes we have music on one end. Mm -hmm. The other end, sometimes it's wine, a little bit more music, but uh, just a comment okay. that I've heard, okay? Thank, Thank you. you so much for all your help. Thank you. Anyone else? Ms. Wilson, I want to thank you for what you and the Chamber does for our city, um, especially with the limited staff. I just want to make a real quick comment about the volunteer that you have working downstairs. I get nothing but compliments about her. So uh, please let her know that we do hear, and uh, everything I hear about what she does and how she spends time with people coming in is just nothing but positive. So, but thank you very much for having staff like that as well. And Excellent. I believe she is a volunteer, isn't she? She's a volunteer. She did receive our Volunteer of the Year Award at our annual dinner as well, and we are very lucky to have her, so I'll pass that along. She'll appreciate that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, thanks, Ken. Thanks. City Manager's Report. Thank you, Mayor and Council. I have a, <clears throat> excuse me, a few items tonight. I want to remind everybody we will be having a special council meeting here Thursday, December 6th at 6.30 in the Chambers. Um, we are going to be swearing in the new mayor and council members, and we will also be discussing the process on how to fill the empty council seat. So that'll be a very important, very critical piece that we have to get through. Another meeting, December we're having a, a, lot, a number of special meetings. Another one for the public is Saturday, December 8th from 9 a.m. to noon. We will be holding a financial update. It's not the budget kickoff yet, it's the financial update to the, for the city council. Myself being the brand new person here, I wanted to give the council an update of where I see we are and what it looks like we're going to end up the current uh, fiscal year and what the potential number would be for next uh, budget cycle. And it'll also serve, uh, and, uh, serve as a prelude to coming budget cycle. There's also going to be some coffee and donuts at 8.30 to 9, entice people to come in <laughs> and see what's going on. Uh, it's really there for the council to ask questions once they see the presentation. It's also there for as many citizens to come out, ask questions that we'll have a number of staff members there. Um, we'll answer as many as we can. If we don't have the answer, we'll, we'll look it up and get back to the person. But so it's sort of an open workshop for everybody. I do wanna remind, oh, and right after this, we could go to the Jubilee at the Chambers. It's right down the street. So if we end at 12, we can move right over there. Uh, riverbed cleanup is still going on. We're gonna have a discussion on that in just a moment, but I think, it, to me, it's a very big number and it's a little bit shocking, but to date, that was as of today, uh, the vendor, the contractor, has removed just over 725,000 pounds of trash from the riverbed. It's much more than I first offered up to the council when we were talking about this. Um, but we'll come back to that in another agenda item. Christmas parade is this Friday, 6 p.m., and the outlook right now is for no rain, so that's good. 
I will be attending the LAFCO meeting in Santa Maria on Thursday, I believe it starts at 1.30, to discuss the need for an ad hoc committee of the LAFCO Commission to discuss the future availability of the city to annex land, such as ag land, into the city limits. It's very critical for the city to have that ability and not have an outside force prohibit us from, from growing uh, Oxnard, or Oxnard, that's where I was, Lompoc. Sorry. Um, the city, uh, another one, the city, in order to help reduce the financial deficit, we will be closed the week of December 24th through the 31st. Uh, there'll be a skeletal staff, staff working on mission critical items. Anyone paying utility bills, as an example, please be sure to place them in the drop box in the city hall parking lot. Be sure to include your name, address, and account number on the envelope. There will be no meeting, which is the first Tuesday of January, because it does fall on January 1st, which is New Year's Day, and the city offices will be closed that day. And last but not least, I want to turn it back over to the mayor for a very special presentation. Okay. Mr. Pannoni, can I have you step forward, please? Beating me out of here by two days. <laughs> so um, those of you that have been around for a while know that Joe is currently our city attorney. Um, he has been actually with the city since 1992. He served as special counsel to the redevelopment agency and the successor agency from 92 to 2009. He was hired as general counsel to the city of Lompoc in 2009 and has served faithfully very, very well. I mean, I can't even say how many expletives I could give you. No, I mean, yeah, um, very, very good. Uh, it's been a, just a real pleasure working with you. And I can't, can't imagine what we're gonna do without you other than you trained a great person to take over for us. Jeff's gonna do just great for us. So anyway, I've got a little plaque for you. It's from the city of Lompoc. It's presented to Joe Pannoni, city attorney, in great recognition and appreciation of your years of dedicated service given to the citizen, to the city of Lompoc and the, with integrity and honor. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, thank you to the community. Um, I've, it's been a real pleasure um, being able to assist the city with the legal issues you have and assisting the city moving forward. I appreciate the opportunity you have given me and your predecessor gave me. I also appreciate working with your staff. You have an outstanding staff and I've been doing city attorney work for 38 years and your staff is terrific uh, in comparison to the staffs I've worked with. Um, from the lowest level person to the highest level person, they're really terrific. So you should feel much appreciative of them and the community knows because they see the, uh, what the staff does, um, but it's important to know that they are helpful and I have enjoyed working with them. I've also enjoyed working with the different personalities that are on the council over the years um, and I enjoy when you're able to work together and that's the best for the community is to create ability to compromise and come to good decisions for the community. And I know your hearts are all in there to do work for the community. So I don't say anything but future uh, good things for the community and thank you very much. Now, even though Joe is leaving us as city attorney, he will still remain with the firm on a part-time basis and is available to us if needed. So a lot of institutional knowledge there. So thanks again, Joe. Okay, public comment on the consent calendar. Um, the consent calendar consists of items that are generally considered to be routine and will be passed with one motion by the council unless a council member chooses to pull an item. Any items to be pulled? With no comments, I will entertain a motion. Oops, I want public comment. Public comment on the consent calendar before I take the motion. Council members, John Lynn Lompoc, resident. 
First, I want to tell you I'm a little disturbed that the uh, city expenditures are no longer on the consent calendar. Now, as we know, I've missed a couple council meetings, so maybe you guys changed the plan. But uh, you have a fiduciary duty to the residents of Lompoc, and you also have a duty to make sure that funds are not misallocated. And today you've been presented with the expenditures from September 24th to November 2nd. You don't have the expenditures from November 2nd to November 30th, which you would typically have. And the sheets that you do have don't have an account code. So you know who got the money, and you know how much they got, but you have no idea what they got it for. With regard to uh, item number two, transit buses, I hope that in the next round the city will do what so many cities have done, which is look into electric buses. Uh, that is certainly the coming trend, and speaking on behalf of the Utility Commission, we'd love to sell you more electricity for the buses. Uh, BYD has a large bus factory in Lancaster, and they are a plethora of information about electric buses. And finally, with regard to item four, uh, I would certainly hope that you would support that. Today, the only clinical testing laboratory in Lompoc, which has nothing to do with cannabis, is in the industrial zone and has been for decades. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Consent calendar. Seeing no one rise, we're gonna close public comment and bring back the council. Any item to be pulled? We don't entertain a motion. You, you voted. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Yeah. I'm, ready to, I'm, I'm ready. I'm um, ready. I move to accept the consent calendar. And do I have a second? I'll second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Let's vote. That passes 5 0. Thank you. Okay, we are going to move on to item number five. Item number five is introduction of ordinance number 1657, parentheses 18, regarding administrative fines for illegal cannabis cultivation. And Mr. This Mayor? Is, uh, yes. You want to go back to oral communication? I'm sorry? The bottom. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We missed oral communication. This is my last meeting. I'm trying to get out of here. I'm trying to speed it up. Okay, I'm sorry. Oral communication. This is your opportunity to speak to us for up to three minutes on any item that come, can come before this council. Good evening, everyone. I just wanted to introduce myself. My name is Isabel Happel, and I would just like to say thank you for giving me the opportunity to be part of the Youth Commission. Thank you, Isabel. This is one fine young lady. Um, if you didn't get to see her resume at the last meeting when we appointed her, take, go back and look at it. It is absolutely remarkable. Congratulations, Isabel. Anyone else? Oral communication. Okay, now I'm gonna close oral communication and now we'll go to item number five. And Chief Walsh. Thank you, Mayor, City Council. We, we talked about this at the last uh, meeting and, and you, you as a uh, board changed the, the, the fines, about the only thing that changed. Uh, Jeff's not here to, to, to help me with the legal piece of it, but so we're bringing it back with the change in the fine structure, and that's about the only change there is, so if you have any questions. Uh, any questions? Okay, so let's see. I do have a comment on that. Um, so, Chief, there was a comment last time, and some of the reasoning that we want to give a, a warning for the first offense was we didn't want to go after people that were growing seven plants instead of six plants. I don't think that was ever the intent. I mean, no. we're not out there looking for someone growing seven plants. No, I, plants, nine no. Plants. I, I come from Oregon. We've, we've done this a lot. You know, it's, it's the person growing 100 that should only have the six. Uh, and it's also the people that are, are selling out the back door or, or completely in the black market, or they've, you know, you talk to Colorado and uh, folks will set up a dispensary with no, never telling the city and they'll just act like they're legitimate until we shut them down. Those kinds of things. The, the folks that are 
bending the rules or completely violating them. So we needed to put that in our ordinance so we have a little bit of, we have another tool in our toolbox. And I think the legitimate cannabis operators are gonna want us to have this tool so that we can, you know, cause they'll undercut them price and everything. So uh, we're not gonna be ticky tacky. We don't, we don't have the time anyways. So in your opinion, in your opinion, is there any reason why someone that would be violating this ordinance would be doing it by, by a mistake, just, just unaware of the consequences of the law. Sure, that's definitely possible. Okay. Yeah. Okay, okay very good. And, and Mr. No Mayor, problem. if I may just add, just, just to clarify the record, the, what's being added here is being added based on a state statute, and the focus of it is someone doing something in violation of your building code that's related to cannabis. So really the person in their house having seven plants rather than six plants, this really isn't the thing that you'd use for that. We have other uh, laws to deal with that. This is just fines for people who are operating cannabis operations before they get all their building permits approved. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, public comment. No public comment. We'll close public comment, bring back to the council. Discussion? Motion? I'll go ahead and move staff recommendation. I'll second. Okay. Uh, discussion? Okay. Again, like I did on the first time, I'm going to be voting against it, not because I'm against um, the ordinance. I'm in favor of the ordinance, except I was not in favor of giving a one-time pass for the first violator, because in my opinion, anyone growing more than the six plants is violating the law, and I don't think we should give passes on violating the ordinance, okay? So I'm gonna be voting no on it for that reason. Okay, let's vote. That passes 4-1, thank you. Item number six, which is introduction of ordinance numbers 1658 parentheses 18, an adoption of, let's see, an adoption of urgency ordinance number 1659 parentheses 18 to prohibit overnight parking on Cordova Avenue Aviation Drive and to create an exception to the safe parking ordinance to comply with Martin versus City of Boise. And this is Mr. Troop. Mayor, Mayor and Council, if I may ask to possibly, if you'll consider switching the order of number six and number seven, and that we actually look at number seven first. Um, it's the safe parking pilot program. Okay, um, to change the order, I need the majority of council to agree on that. I'll agree. I will. That's fine. Do I have one more? One more. Okay, so we will go to item number seven, which is consideration of safe parking pilot program and or potential uh, amendments to the safe parking ordinance program, ordinance number 1649 parentheses 18 and resolution number one or 6179 parentheses 18. Mr. Troop. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, as we all know, we've been working hard and diligently trying to do the cleanup in the riverbed. We went through and we had the eviction of the individuals living there. We created the triage center, which then we had a great success. In fact, that model is being used in other areas of the county and possibly other areas of the state. Um, the problem is we do still have individuals that are living in uh, motorhomes, RVs, vehicles, we'll just call them, um, throughout the city. And it does cause issues because some of these are much, much older vehicles that are not up to um, a level that's safety, that some of them are leaking, the, the sewage is coming out, they're not roadworthy, other items they're out of, um, the registration is missing or out of, out of date. Um, there, there is concern, and they are throughout the city. They, they will park a lot of times in the off areas that are off beaten path, and uh, there's a lot of times we'll find the waste left over, be it needles, sharps, trash, and other things. So it is, a, it is an issue that's going on. It sort of moved somewhat from the riverbed up into our streets now. So one of the things that the city did a while back, and it was before my time, but they created the safe parking ordinance, and that was essentially not allowing people to live in their vehicles. But in doing so, we had to, as a city, supply a place for the people to move their vehicles that they were living in. 
to a safe parking facility. So there's a lot of steps involved in this. There's a lot of concern. There's a lot of sometimes finances involved in this. We reached out to Santa Barbara. Theirs runs about $132,000 a year. With all the other cleanup, we're, in, we're strapped in a deficit at the moment. We thought, we'll reach out. Instead of going first to how we were looking at the Cordova closure and the air aviation is, try this pilot program. We're presenting it as a three-month trial period um, right out in the front um, by the, the police station here. So it's a large enough area. The police can then patrol it. They can do shifts in, shifts out. It would be from 9 at night until 6 in the morning is when an individual could move their facility that they're living in there. They would have a, a very large list of rules. No, you know, Again, no leakage of any kind of waste. No drug use. has to be a dry camp. Um, we will have, um, we're in the works right now with Good Sam to have a facilitator that will help work with these different individuals to get them into more permanent housing. That was one of the stipulations we were working on. Um, we just got some funding through the HEAP funds that were coming out. That'll give us about one-third to one-half of a, uh, a full FTE. That's about what we need for a pilot program. And one of the things I know there's been discussion, do we want it right out here in front? But we don't have anywhere close by right now that's that can be secured. It's a low cost from a security standpoint because we have our police department right there. So we don't have to hire a security at night to keep patrolling that. Um, there's some other issues in here of, of why, but from a three-month pilot program, we thought this would give us a better way to figure out the budget. Is it going to run 132000 Do we need extra staff to secure and have someone standing out there the whole time? Um, from the heap, the, the other part is they transition over. Um, what will that take? Will that half-time person be enough time? Do we have something else? So three months, we'll be able to figure out if, if it's working. Is it helping bring people off the streets? Um, if it's too successful, that's always a possibility, such as our triage center was much more successful than we thought it would be. We can come back to council. Council can direct us to come back if it gets too, too much and say, we got to stop for now. We'll have to go back as staff, revisit our plan, find if this place isn't big enough, look for another location for the safe parking, then come back again. So it's really just asking the council for a period of three months to try this pilot program that meets with the safe ordinance park, safe parking ordinance is done. And I can answer any questions. Any questions for Mr. Troop? Councilmember Vega. Councilmember Vega. Um, Mr. Troop, is it possible with without knowing what the influx of people that will be helping here to exclude City Hall from the safe parking program? Uh, I heard your comments about because it's close to the police station, but I think it doesn't make Lompoc look any better to have something there on the main street. So let's just be blunt about it. Mm -hmm. I don't think that we should have anything regardless if it's nine o'clock at night to six in the morning here in City Hall parking lot. So I think that without knowing the, the amount of people that would be utilizing this because of all the restrictions, um, I'd like to see it not be part of the safe parking program, so. The, the City Hall or? City Hall parking lot, because I think that we don't know exactly how many people we're going to be using, mm -hmm. or at the very least to use it as a last resort instead of a first resort. I think we're trying to raise the bar here with Lompoc. Yes, we're trying to uh, move people around and, and give them a safe environment. But H and Ocean right here, we're a real, really small community. Mm -hmm. I think we're sending the wrong message for people that want to come in here and they want to come in here and develop, and you're telling us that we want to put our money into something that can be sustainable and successful. Do you have a comment or? Oh, I, I, we, we've looked around for other places. That's, that's the hard part. That's why we thought with a three-month process, if it does get too, too successful again, we would have to stop it because right now we don't really have anywhere else we can go. Um, our transit center is being built, so that's turned now into a construction site. There was a, a parcel up front. I looked into that. Um, possibly over by the chamber. It's, it's the, the one thing that we don't have is we would then have to hire security to do that, and we don't have a budget yet for that. Um, that would be a problem on that one. But again, it does give the council, the way this is written, the ability to just say, stop, this is too much, let's, let's revisit, come up with another solution. If I could ask there, I, I believe we have other locations that were part of, uh, weren't there some churches and other things that were involved here that they designated? 
as safe parking as part of the program? Nobody that has come forward to say they would like to do that because of liability. Um, we had to check with our own liability insurance and we are covered. They said it, having it here by the PD would be a very good benefit for the liability insurance people. Um, the other groups that had talked about it have not yet stepped forward to uh, Thank you. do that. Councilmember Mosby. I'm just wondering if there's a, a natural trigger mechanism that if it wasn't working or too successful, do you have something that, you know, it wouldn't have to be come back through council and take a month? I mean, is there something? Well, we could, we could, you know, the one big trigger to me is you can't get in the parking. There's too many vehicles in the parking lot. So that would be the first one because it would be a limited amount. Um, we could have it if it's, you know, more than 10 vehicles, let's say that anything over 10, then we need to put a stop to this for now, come back and figure out a, a more desirable or even larger place. Um, I don't know how many would actually show up because they do have to, per the regulations, they do have, the people there have to follow these rules. And part of it is working towards getting into more permanent housing. So um, that might keep some people away. But we can we could set a limit, you know, anything over ten. I, just, I was just wondering if there's anything else besides numbers or something else, because sometimes if you bring things back to council, it could be another month or two months. Yeah, no. If, if if we wanted to add that to this, amend amend the resolution, or and say at your authority as well, okay. that you could that way. You, yeah, which I think you too. have that ability, anyways. But because yep. again, like I said, if you're seeing that, do you want to? Too no, I'd like to add that. Then if you know, we'll just add my, you know, I I will look at it. I can. Take a look, if you will, just use my judgment, and if I see the parking lot is more than full and people are waiting to get in, then I know we need to. Or other so issues. It. I mean, it's Yeah, any other issues too, yeah. And I guess my, my other concern is, um, has anybody really gone there and done a design layout of how they're going to park, flow, and have you run this by the fire chiefs? Is there a no. hydrant there? I mean, is that, you know, packing in that tight, is that something you, that, Fire has looked at as well on this? No, this was sort of, because this doesn't, it won't start at, you know, if you approve it today, it won't start today. So then we'll, we'll go ahead and start mapping out where we can put everybody. Um, and again, it could be two people, it could be more, but. I was just trying to figure the flow through of that design because you get things plugged up in there, people can't back in, back out, and it's right. trying to get around the wrap around the backside, it's. Yeah, well, before anything's <coughs> enforced, we would do that. And then the other thing, talking with the police chief, it wouldn't be okay if it goes into uh, you know, January 1st, let's say, if it goes into effect. We wouldn't start citing people on the 1st. We would then, as soon as we're done and if it's approved, the PD will start noticing them saying, here's a flyer, here's what it's about, you have till this date. And at that point, you know, then they'll start doing the citations. And, and I guess my other question is, if the safe parking program is only going for 90 days, and I know it's something that's going to be discussed a little bit later, that you're implementing the street closures. So if safe parking goes away, are you going to no longer cite people for living on the street? Well, that would be, so if the program in three months, as we get close to the three months, and if it looks like it's being successful, then we'd come back and say, can we have three more months? So, you know, keep working the bugs out of this. Um, if it's not working at all for whatever reason, then the another option which we added in here, if you didn't like the safe parking, we did put the other option was going back to essentially no parking, that, that zoned no parking time back on uh, Cordova and aviation. So it's it's an option two if you want. So if if this goes away, then that, go, that goes away potentially, is that what you're saying? Well, if you want to do this one, then I wouldn't do anything on Cordova because that should take care of the issues that are happening there because those individuals would be required to move over to the safe parking. If you didn't want to do this one, then that would be the option to say, okay, by putting in the zone parking limits, that would take care of that also. Does that make sense? Right, so if we do this one, maybe number six, six might not have to be introduced at all. Because you, you could be able to enforce number the previous seven. ordinance that we had before which is the no park camping on streets because you could do this. Correct, that is right. Okay. Well, if I may, we'll need to bring back a revision to the code next meeting in order to 
to enforce it that way because the current park safe parking requirements requires a separate organization to be the one setting up the safe parking program, which is different than what we're discussing. It's the city doing it. So we're going to have to make some amendments to that and maybe even the resolution. But that won't happen until the 18th. And, and hopefully if this goes through, we can get one of the other components, which was another group maybe picking up and, and well, doing do. a we unit somewhere, right? Yep. We do part, have part of that problem, too, was, as I recall, is that also required some funding, which is what was the concern was for the city, because right. they would want some funding from the city to be able to do that. But we do have good SAM funding. That's for, the, for that person. That was sort of the person doing that, um, that portion of it, working with the individuals. Our portion was covering the liability and the security. So um, we do have an outside vendor, if you want to call them that, that would work with the individuals. That would not be us doing that interaction. So we can, we can get with the city attorney and make sure it's, it's fine-tuned in that sense if he has any other questions. But and, and so after the, the proposal temporary, you would potentially bring this back again? We could reanalyze this after a... Right, so at the end of three months or close to it, we wouldn't wait to the very end because we didn't want it to go away. If it's doing well, we could say it, it costs this much, we've had this many visitors, we've had this, what, you know, sort of like the triage, what the success rate was. Um, and again, then present it, and then the council could then say, okay, that was worth the cost, or it was too much of a cost, and then we'd have to go then reevaluate, at which point we would pull back on the safe parking, and it would go back to the way it is actually today. And then maybe you might see if another location might work. Yeah, we could do as that as well. Too. So this is right. Yeah, this this was just the first three months, and then during that period of time, we can look for other other spots. Thank you, Councilman Vega. Um, to council here, I think this is a poor choice of locations. I think what we took is we took an initial proposal that wasn't fully vetted to use City Hall just because of the location of the police, uh, the police station. But if you think about it, we had the triage center out at River Park. The only, the only thing that's missing here is the fact that there's no security guard or police out there. And that would have been a perfect place also if we had the security issue here. I think that we have to, out of respect for the city, look out for our own properties, which are on the main drag, they're right here, H and Ocean, and I think if we want our city to be presentable in a in a in a in a in an upscale fashion that we're trying to attract businesses, regardless if it's at night or in the morning, I think that we can find another location that would be suitable. It does have to be sponsored by a separate entity, so it's not a city-run project. It's just a proposal that we're at being asked to uh, introduce as an ordinance in order so that we can enforce our, our parking. Uh, the parking issues on, on Cordoba and aviation. So I think that we need to brainstorm that a little bit more before we open up City Hall to being uh, a parking lot for that. So it's my comment on that. Okay, and you know, in addition to what Councilmember Vega says, you know, the just the appearance of it being here at City Hall, I've already voiced my opinion, and don't. Listen to what I say before you right away think that I'm judging the homeless. Um, the security issue, we have people coming to our council meetings, we have people coming to planning commission, we, we have many of the commission meetings here, often they last till past uh, nine o'clock. And what I wanna say is it's not that I'm judging homeless people as being dangerous, but just by our comments that it's, it's safer because we have the police department right there in case there is any, um, any problems, okay? So just by our ordinance saying that, we're interpreting or we're insinuating that there is potential danger. So in addition to not being appropriate, I believe, on one of our main streets, I'm concerned about the citizens coming to our meetings and then fearing going out in the parking lot with a bunch of homeless people there. Remember, I'm not saying homeless are dangerous, but we're inferring by our comments in this that we... It's, it's nice that it's near the police department. Now I've got, a, I see a bunch of my friends here from the fire department, and I guess they're here because they must know what I'm gonna be saying. I don't think they do, but um, we've got another city lot. It's right across from the fire department, in between the fire department and the police station. We've got a, a big parking lot. I'm sorry, fellas. Um, that could be used. It's again, it's a city lot. Um, it is not on one of our main streets. It's between the fire department and the police station. We may want to, for the, a short period of time, three months trial period, 
okay. consider it there. Um, that would be an alternate. My choice all along, Councilman Vega, I, I somewhat agree with you that River Park would be better, but I think the triage center in River Park was a bad choice too. As we, ex as we found out, it was um, too close to the homeless that were living in the river, and we had a lot of trafficking going be between there with prostitution, drug sales, so it wasn't good. We've got people using that park. That's a city park that paid to have their campers in there, and now we're going to have these. It's not a very good road anyway going in and out, so I don't, would hate to see that. Um, my choice all along is right up the hill, um, county facility by the bridge house, a huge parking lot there. That is the ideal location. Now, the bridge house says we've got a clean and sober location. We don't want a bunch of homeless people there. You know what? Um, maybe we have to have some sort of security there if, you, if you're concerned about it. That would be my first choice, the county facility up by the bridge house. Second choice, unfortunately, is our lot across the street from the fire department, in between the fire department and the um, police station, if, you, if we want to have security. So I've always been concerned about, I, I, number one, this ordinance is important. I think it's important that we have this ordinance. Um, if we want to get people off the streets, we have to have a st safe parking program. So it's important we have an ordinance. I just disagree with the location. So, Council Member Osborne. So I think one of the things my fellow council members are forgetting, those of you that are worried about it being unsafe, it's more about the safety for those that choose to enter the program. Having a safe place to park is first and foremost a safe place for the individual seeking the assistance. That's why it's called safe parking. It's not making it safer for the neighborhood they're leaving. That is a benefit. What it's actually creating is those that want and desire help to enter a program that has a very long list of mandates that they have to be willing to agree to day in and day out enter the program to acquire services and abide by those rules and being on city property means we're near the police department so they're safe and they don't have to be harassed by other potential problems of fellow homeless individuals who are not wanting help who do choose that lifestyle and don't want to contribute to society and don't want to get better and don't want to get out of the situation. So it's primarily a safe parking program for the individuals that are down on their luck and this is their last resort and this is how they're living. The second part about it being at City Hall, let's face it, we have to take ownership of this problem. This is our community. These are still our residents and we have to care for them. So having it on City Hall property engages those that want to be a part of this program. So those churches, so those other social organizations, some of those businesses that have large lots that are not used at night because we're stepping up might be willing to step up and be a location. That's why when you see the city of Santa Barbara and the county of Santa Barbara and the city of San Luis Obispo, their city and county parking lots participate in this to show that they have skin in the game and why other businesses and nonprofits and faith-based organizations are willing to let their parking lots be a part of the program. So I get that the assumption is, is that it's people we don't want to see, it's people we don't want to be involved with, and that we don't feel safe around. And that's a misperception. That is a part of that community, but it is not the entire community. So I, for one, really appreciate the fact that staff is realizing we need to have this program, realizing we don't have the funds, realizing we're strapped, and has identified some of the HEAP funds to allow us to start this program so we can better understand it, have a true budget item that we can discuss, and potentially at the end of three months have additional partners. Maybe there's some businesses in the community who want to step up and contribute. Maybe they don't have a lot, but maybe they have a fund that they want to contribute to help pay for security for an, another business that has a huge empty lot that wants to contribute. Maybe there's a church that says we want to use our lot, but we can't afford the security, but we're going to partner with this other nonprofit who's going to pay for the security. So I think this is an inroad to a solution that we as a community desperately need to address, and we need to do it respectfully, both of our current citizens who pay taxes and are housed and contribute and have jobs, but also to respect those that are 
trying to get off the streets, and this is one of those ways to do it. So for me, I, I appreciate staff and the police department willing to patrol this, really willing to consider having it on city property, and, and it's an added responsibility, and I know that's gonna be extra work and, and you're strapped, so I appreciate that part of it. Councilman Osborne, your uh, comments about the safety for the the people in the RV is well taken. I mean, I understand. I hadn't thought about it that way, but I understand it. So thank you for making that comment. Councilman Vega. Um, Mayor Lingle, I appreciate your comments and the other choices that we have. I have to disagree that I think that the council needs to be strong in their approach. Uh, we have an initial ordinance that's been, appro that's been uh, sent in here and proposed by staff. And we normally, every time, just like Councilman Mosby asked, it's a 30 day or a 60 day or a 90 day trial period. We have a choice right here now to make a better choice instead of just following the recommendation to say, do you want it really here at City Hall? I don't, and all the people that I've spoken to don't. I think that the visual and what we want Lompoc to be is our choice because of the constituents we represent and the people that we want. Do you think that the, the people in Lompoc that live around here would like to have that here in, on, on the main street? I don't think so. I think it's our choice right now to have some strength to say, hey, we need a different location. Mayor Lingle already proposed a different location. So we have a choice. It may not be the best location, but I'd just like us to have a little bit of strength on what we want our city to be. Any other discussion? Thank you, Mr. Hoop. Uh, any? Oh, um, you know, the, the bridge house will be a difficult ask because it's not our property. Um, the fire lot, I haven't, I'd have to go back and look at it and see if it's large enough. I don't know if the chief thinks it would be large enough or our police chief, do you have any comments on that? Okay, now they're both gonna gang up on me. The, the lot across the fire station actually is used 24 seven. We have three trailers of our own in there and that's where all our employee parking is and that's also where the sandbag operation takes place too. So we. Really, there's no room for there. Uh, we also use the warehouse quite frequently. We store extra equipment in there and we store our extra brush truck in there. And we're in and out of that every day. So I, I don't think it would be a very uh, good place at this time to, to be used. Okay, thank you. There is, there is an option, well, it, it is an option, but it's, um, just west of H, where we do the farmer's market during the regular times when it's not downtown, that parking lot there. I'm just throwing that out there. It's a city-owned lot. I think the police chief had a comment. You know, the reason we kept coming back to, to this lot is, uh, is the impact. There's not a lot of residents that will be impacted because we're here. Um, we thought about Dewey Center, but again, there's a lot of residents there. Um, it has to be a lot that you could drive, you, you have a good point, you have to drive in and out of it with these big rigs and, you know, they would run over the horrible fence that the fire department put up. I'm a former carpenter, I'm <laughs> appalled by it. Maybe it would make it look better, but anyways, I digress. But I think it needs to be a big parking lot. And the skin in the game, I think, is important because, you know, a lot of uh, the churches, we've, we've gotten together with them a lot. And they say, you know, they're kind of interested, but, you know, the insurance part and the unknown of what it's going to look like, you know, if, if uh, Peace Lutheran has a huge parking lot, what if 50 people showed up? They couldn't handle that. So, you know, so if we start small in ours, then maybe, maybe the others will, will, will see that we're doing it and they might jump on. That's, that's why we chose here. It's just we don't have a lot of options in this town. That's our problem, I think. Councilman Starbuck. Chief, let me ask you, would it become a difficult situation if we use, say, part of the airport property? Yeah, I hadn't thought of that. You mean down back behind the airport? Or I down, don't know down where. Down? I'm just saying we, we have property, and it's pretty isolated. It's a way. Yeah. Um, it, I, I don't know. I mean, is it a difficult patrol or something to add to patrolling, or do you guys make rounds through there randomly anyhow? Or? Right. Yeah, I don't think that would be bad. You know, the, 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 the point about being next to the river, that was really difficult, the triage center. 
But I would say this about folks that are living in their cars, they're a different breed. Uh, a lot of the ones that I've talked to on Cordoba and, and airport there are um, very, uh, very independent. Uh, one's a former Marine, has a job, uh, feel safe there. So wherever it is, they need to feel like their stuff's not gonna get stolen. If we're close to the river, there are people still in our river that we're dealing with and they'll come up and, you know, when they're at work, take all their stuff. Uh, you know, some of them will, not all of them, but some of them will do that. So but wherever it is, they need to feel comfortable as well. So, Mr. Wilkie, you have a comment? One thing that's kind of been missing in this conversation is one of the reasons why we're su suggesting this area is, frankly, the cost. Um, not having to have separate uh, security away from this area will make it less expensive. If we go to the airport, as you know, the airport is FAA um, regulated, we'd have to pay rent for them to be there. So we'd be paying rent to the airport out of general fund monies for us to have this program. And that's one of the reasons why some of the other agencies aren't, are apprehensive because um, the cost of providing the insurance for our program um, would in some instances is prohibitive. So by us doing it on a city property, not something we have to rent, would help eliminate that, those costs. And frankly, we're looking to try to make this as the least expensive option as we can, and the least expensive op option is here. So, real quick for the for the security piece, just using the triage, we had to increase that for a longer period of time, and we had to have two people because of the issues that were going on. But for that month period, I believe it was close to twenty thousand, a little over twenty thousand dollars, to have that staffed with security. That was there all day, so it wouldn't be that. We just need them there from nine to six. But there was a, there was a cost there. You know, so maybe it's eight thousand dollars for a, a month. But that is a cost that we haven't built into the budget. So I can okay. look into more of that. I have not. Any other questions for Mr. Troop? Thank you. Okay, we'll open this up to the public. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm Pastor Brian Halterman. I'm the manager of the Bridge House Shelter and uh, the pastor of my commission, which reaches out to the homeless and the marginalized that are in our community. And uh, there's a lot that I've jotted down as we've talked tonight. I was involved in the original talking of safe parking. Um, but a couple of things that talk about numbers, just about safe parking. Um, safe parking, that number is dictated by those that are willing to accept case management services. So you're not going to see a parking lot full of 50 RVs or cars that show up here because those people are not going to come just like the river bottom. Only those who wanted the service showed up at the triage center. It's dictated by the rules because there'll be stringent rules. When you look through the safe parking manual from Santa Barbara, it's very stringent rules. They have to abide by those. They have to follow by those. That dictates the number of people who want to be part of it who will choose to be part of it. It will also dictate the number of successes that happen once it goes on. It's been thrown out about, well, let's use the Bridge House parking lot or up by there. It's a great idea in theory, but you do have people up there that are experienced one day sober. And the first day in their life, they're experienced at a time where they're not dealing with drugs and alcohol. And to just say that doesn't matter, disregards that person as a person. So it's important to do, but this is a partnership with Good Sam. Christy did reach out. Good Sam did write it into the heat funding. It is case management by those people that are out there. And I can tell you now, when it comes to the number of phone calls that our law enforcement gets from the Bridge House, I, I don't think it's really that much. Why? Because we expect them to abide by the rules and our case managers enforce that. But what becomes even more disturbing than that, and I'll try to say this in one minute, is that we keep talking like this is not the image we want of our community. We shouldn't put them in front of City Hall. We should put them out way on the other side of the airport. But you know what? The heart of a community is decided 
by how we treat the least of these in our community. We're talking about the least of these. And for the number of people you get that call you guys and say, don't put it there, there's a whole other group of people that I talk to every day out there that says, you know what, it's about time City Hall does something. And so I think it's a great idea to put it here. The security is here. The safety is here. The number is here. Am I working with Bridge House to say, hey, let's get about a half a dozen parking spots out there? I sure am. And I'd love to see us do it for those that can comply with the program that's required out there. But I do just encourage us that to shove these people to the background says that we don't care about those that are the least of these in our city. And I think it's time that we as a city stand up to that. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Next, please. Good evening, Mayor and Council members, members of the public. I support this uh, parking program. Um, I've, I've listened to your conversations this evening and some of the, the highlights or points that you've brought up, um, Councilman Vega, regarding the image. Image is important in Lompoc. We want to clean up our image. We've had some snide comments from politicians about our community before. I won't repeat that. but. There's definitely a perception about Lompoc, and we, we want to clean that perception up. So that is something that we should consider. However, we've had recent decision from the Supreme Court that talks about homeless and where they're allowed to live and where they're allowed to sleep overnight. And government property is part of that, was part of that decision. Now, I, I don't know how that relates specifically to parking, but I think that's something that should be considered. You mentioned that we should possibly consider some other locations. The city manager mentioned the location where the farmer's market is. I think a, a better location would be on the other side of the Chamber of Commerce in the parking lot where the swap meet used to be held. You have the bus location that you have built there. You have trash uh, collections there. You have uh, other resources there. Another option could possibly be, and maybe because it's near the riverbed, it, it won't be a good location. But uh, Riverbend Park, Riverbend Park has quite a large parking area. It has uh, several porta potties. It has uh, trash areas. Um, perhaps that is something that you can consider. I know that you've um, mentioned before putting lighting out there, or that's been in discussions before. Um, but w one thing that I would like to bring back about this program is its intention. And what was the goal of this program? Was it to provide a safe place for people to park who are, as Council Member Osborne says, down on their luck? Yes, I think that is what this program was designed for. It wasn't designed to uh, do anything else outside of that, but to bring people a place, uh, to, an opportunity to park overnight in a safe manner. And I believe that taking the step for this program was in the right direction. However, I think that we're over-regulating this. We have, as Council Member Osborne stated, there's a lot of requirements that people have to follow to be in this program. So what is the difference between somebody who's camping out at River Park, we don't have security out there because they paid, they paid 20 bucks, 10 bucks, whatever it costs to spend the night. These people are just spending the night in a parking lot. Why do we have to go through all these regulations to allow someone to park overnight? And also, if the sewage is an issue, consider giving out uh, grants or some kind of voucher to allow those people to freely go dump their sewage at the city facility at River Park. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. My name is Sylvia King. Before I knew this was coming up tonight, I had planned on speaking on the same subject. Mainly my uh, suggestion was going to be, here we have this old swimming pool that is city property, is scheduled to be torn down, has a roof, has facilities, bathrooms, uh, showers, whatever, and parking, and how much damage could someone do if it's gonna be torn down anyhow? Why not utilize it? I'm sure there, there are certain regulations and things that have to be followed, but it's sitting right there. And, uh, you know, it's 
better than just sleeping in the bushes, I would think, for a lot of people. Uh, the other thing that I was also concerned about, I just having moved back to Lompoc and being on Social Security now and having to meet a budget, I was horrified when I wanted to come and connect utilities that I had to come up with $340, even though I paid 2000 or more a year in property taxes. But $340 out of my $900 a month Social Security is a huge chunk, which normally means I don't eat. And are we, by those type of policies and fees, creating more homelessness? <clears throat> Luckily, I'm not in that boat. But are we creating homelessness by asking for those type of fees for people to live here and maybe have a room or an apartment? Maybe it's things, some things that need to be uh, looked over or fees need to be checked. Okay, thank you. Next, please. I'm Kathy Howard, and I support this as a plan. Seems to me like this is a, a very distinct population. Uh, that would be coming with many criteria and that Mr. Throop would have the power to call a close to this at any point if he thinks it's out of control. It's for a limited amount of time. Um, and I think that we owe this to a population that has a po potential to uh, move on out of their cars and into the mainstream of our town. I support it. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Good evening again, John Lynn Lompoc resident. So I, I hear all of your points and um, I think City Hall parking lot is a bad location because of the, the layout of the parking lot. Um, having had an RV for a whole lot of years and been in and out of many places with it and a whole lot of tow trucks trying to get in and out of little places like this parking lot, it really isn't conducive. However, comma, we have the perfect location very nearby at JM Park. We have a long parking lot with easy parallel parking on both sides. It's illuminated with street lights, so it's a safe location. To allow the police department to better supervise it, we could certainly put in a couple of the pole cameras that we have, and if we happen to be out of them, I'm sure this council would authorize the less than $1,000 for two more pole cameras to be put up so that the facility could be monitored from the police department. It would be much easier to get vehicles in and out of, and if we are lucky enough to find 25 people that want to participate in the program, and I truly hope we do, you know, we want to help them get off the street, there's room for way more than 25 vehicles there. It's not immediately adjacent to a residential neighborhood, it's across the street and the park facilities are readily at hand. So I wish you would consider that location. I think it would be ideal from the standpoint of being able to bring recreational vehicles in and out, and a couple of cameras could accommodate the security that we want to have. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Next, please. Seeing no one rise, we're going to close public comment and bring it back to the council. Discussion? What's your pleasure? Councilmember Vega. I think that's an excellent point that we need to consider. JM Park is actually one of the options. I don't think that uh, Mr. Troop, I don't think we had that as an option before. I think we need to look into that because I think uh, uh, egress and ingress in here is going to be difficult as far as the in and out. Uh, we have a hard time coming in and out sometimes. So I think if somebody had an RV, or some other trailer or something, it would be difficult here to make it around the hoop and the little loop there and to get out of here. So I think that that's probably, uh, unless there's some other reason why we couldn't utilize that open parking lot with, with a huge driveway in and out and it, and it hits a main street. I'm seeing a thumbs up from the police chief. Uh, well, you know, I, I think 
As far as supporting an option, I think I, that option would be something I would support. Not at that link. I still think the City Hall is a poor choice, and I don't think that I want City Hall to be known as the parking lot uh, where anybody can park, because we're going to turn into Cordoba and Aviation Drive, and I understand the safe parking and the compassion part of it. I do wish all these people well, and I do want them taken care of, but I don't think, I, I don't think it's conducive to Lompoc's build out to have it on H and Ocean. Okay, I need other comments or I need a motion. I'll make a motion. Okay, would you want to Well, I'm off? waiting, if, if they're still discussing, I'd like to see if that's a, a viable option that we can present to council, because I think that would be a, a game changer. Talking with our, our recreation expert, um, so we could adjust the hours. I'll look at our city attorney too, because they do have softball little league that could go to nine o'clock. So you'd have a, an in and out, you know, an ingress egress issue possibly there. We could look at adjusting the safe parking from 10 p.m. to the 6 a.m. Is that? Would that require an ordinance change in your safe parking, or is that something we could introduce with a motion? It's currently 10 to 6. Oh, it's currently 10 to 6, he says. Oh. Oh. I got you. We'll, we'll still need some changes to the ordinance to have it be the city lot. Oh, here. So my only concern was um, when this was presented with the HEAP funding to Good Samaritan um, and the potential partnership, uh, safe parking programs are a little scary for any agency to get involved in. There is a lot of liability involved with them. And the people who run the safe parking program in Santa Barbara and Goleta will tell you the same thing. That's the biggest cost they experience is the insurance associated with having such a program. The way we were able to get a little bit more buy-in from Good Samaritan or in order to participate and be our housing navigator, which is essential in this program, if we're really trying to help people, was that component of case management. And the reason they did it was because we said, we will do it here. We will have it here. You will have the buy-in from our police department, and we will be able to help and assist monitor the security. And again, there there is that concern with security. So at JM Park, I'm not sure we would have the housing navigators involved with us. And um, did a lot of research on this to try and find someone to partner. And let's face it, Good Samaritan is our housing services and homeless services provider in this community. So I don't know of anybody else to call on for this that isn't gonna cost us $132,000 a year. So uh, just keep that in mind. If we go with a different location, there is a good chance we're gonna be back here saying we can't do it. So just wanna throw that out there. Um, I'm prepared to make a motion that we use and utilize that location as a, to approve the ordinance for the safe par parking program. If we have another issues, we can come back. It's not something we're gonna have to implement immediately anyway, unless you have the funding available to open that up right away, Jim. So uh, I'd like to make that motion that says, hey, we utilize that location. If, if there's something negative, they can bring it back and you can come back. But in essence, we're actually approving the safe parking ordinance to move forward so we can go to item number seven, which would mean that City Hall would not be the, the primary option here. It would be JM Park. Correct. And do I have a second on that motion? Uh, uh, Council Member Mosby had a call. Yeah, and, and because in the staff report it says nine o'clock, I believe that was that was my doing. Okay. I, I misread because I was working on a different one. So okay, it would and be changed. The other thing is that I would give the second if we added in here on the conclusion part, which is at any time the city council may discuss augmenting or discontinuing the program. We had city council or city manager added to that. That sounds good. I'm good with that. Okay, and I'll give you a second on that. Okay, any other discussion? Okay, I'd like to make an alternate motion on this. Um, I believe we should not vote anything tonight, vote to bring this back at the future council meeting so we can fully investigate it. As dis was discussed, do we have the hundred, possibly $132,000 to operate this program? 
I think we're making this decision without all the information. I'd rather bring it back, make sure we do it right, and not make a decision that's going to cost us the potential $130,000 to operate this program. So my motion is to table this, bring it back at a future meeting. And that's my motion, if I can get a second. Okay, no second, so we'll vote on the original motion. If, if I may, Mr. Mayor? Yeah. Because if this doesn't work, and Good Sam says it doesn't, the city manager has the authority to discontinue this. And obviously, if it's not going to work, we don't have a partner, it's not going to happen there, and it's going to have to go. Okay. This just it stops us from having to delay another two weeks, and hopefully in between you can get the dots connected and show that it's a secure facility and a secure location, as the police chief has acknowledged. And I think it, as far as police and fire, I think J.M. Park would be a lot safer than trying to be out here. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, Mayor. Thank you. Um, that if we do move forward, we can figure this out. And if we cannot do it at J.M., then we will have to come back because that was the position or the location selected. But um, it does allow us to move forward and to connect the dots, as Councilman Mosby said, to make sure we have good SAMs on board and all of our other areas are, are there. May I make an amendment? Of course. You, well, Seth, if it's accepted by the... Exactly. But I just had this thought that we've been discussing the whole time how not to delay implementing this program and being able to start the 30 days with the amendments being made at the next meeting that might need to be made in the ordinance. Uh, that not only saying that JM Park is the current choice of location and that we're giving the city manager authority to close the program if issues arrive, and now with a discussion that potentially our partner might back out if we don't agree to the location that's already been submitted, might we ask that you allow the alternate location to be City Hall if the partner backs out so that we don't stop this program and have to come back to Council in early January and have this discussion all over again. I, I really, really, there are so many other issues that fall in line after not addressing this issue that we are going to have to deal with. This solves so many of those concerns for the other parking issues if we can start on this. So my amendment is to ask you to allow the alternate location to be City Hall if JM doesn't map out. So I'll need the motion maker to decide if they want to accept that amendment. I'd prefer it to come back instead of making the alternate motion because I, I think if they have that option, they're, they're going to take the path of least resistance. This so I'd not, like to stick with my original I, motion. I'm sorry, Councilman. That's the, she's not making an alternate motion. She's making an amendment to your motion. I got you. Okay. And so I'd like to keep my original motion with a second from Councilman Mosley. Okay. Not to accept the amendment. Yes, sir. Okay. Any other discussion? Then we let's vote. And that fails, 3-2, okay. Um, that's interesting, so it fails. Would, would someone else like to make a motion? Mr. Pannoni, we can still work? Yep, okay. Council Member Osborne. Um, I'd like to make a motion to accept the safe parking pilot program at City Hall with the amendment to authorize the city manager to close the program if issues arise at his discretion. Do I have a second? And that doesn't have a second. So I will make a motion again that we ask city staff to investigate all the possibilities. Mr. Troop, did you have a question? I, I was going to say that would be my suggestion at this point because there, there are enough variables that have been discussed that we can come back. We, we can tie down Good Sam. We can tie down a couple yeah. other ones and get it cleaned up. I, I really would like to have moved forward. I think we need to move forward. But I think everyone up there has said a couple different items that need to be. Reviewed. And I agree. I think we need to move forward, but I don't think we have the information right now. I believe that's why it failed. We just do not have the information that we need to make that decision. So my motion is to ask staff to, oh, to table this, ask staff to investigate all the unknowns that we have and bring it back at a future date, and that's my motion. I'll give you a second on that. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Let's vote. 
Again, that passes 5-0. Okay. Mr. Pannoni, Mr. Troop, do we go on, go back to number six now? For me, I would recommend we table that item to a future date because the safe parking was the one that if it went forward, great. If you decided not to do it, this was going to be option two and it looks as though we're gonna be doing more, more work on the pilot program. So I would not uh, take that item up and for an action. Okay, Mr. Bernardo, do, do we still need public comment on this or can we make the motion to table it? You can make a motion to table it. Okay, I'm making a motion to table item number six. I'll uh, second. Uh, excuse me, that's item number yeah, number six, yeah, number six. Do I have a second? Yes. Okay, any discussion? Let's vote. I had my light on. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, Councilmember Osborne. Uh, uh, this is actually a, a major issue over in this area. There is... Uh, health issues, there's waste issues, there's traffic issues. I, I, I think tabling it again, this, this solves, I granted, I know it's a spot zoning issue, but it temporarily solves a problem that is not gonna go away for potentially another two months for this area. So I personally do not think we should table this as well. Okay, um, it's been moved and seconded. If you want to make an alternate motion and get council to approve. Okay, so it's been moved and seconded uh, to table item number six. Let's vote. Okay, that passes 4-1. Whew, we're having fun tonight. Okay, we're moving on to item number eight. Introduction of ordinance number 1660, parentheses 18, related to administrative fines for violations of sewer system regulations. Uh, Katrina Dorsey. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Katrina. I am the water resources protection technician at the wastewater plant and I'm giving the presentation. So uh, I'm gonna start off with the fun fact today and I'm not sure if everyone knows it or not, but a reason that Rome fell, one of the many reasons, was their failing sewer infrastructure. Uh, so a little background here. The water resources, or sorry, um, the water treatment plant has to abide by rules and regulations set forth by the EPA, the state and federal laws. And if we are found to be not in compliance with our permit, at a minimum we can be charged $3,000 a day. This isn't something that is rare. The city of Paso Robos was um, fined half a million dollars, I believe it was last year, for not being in compliance. Um, and so this, the system that we currently have places a really strong emphasis on the city attorney doing all the prosecuting for people that aren't in compliance. And that obviously creates some problems. Um, he doesn't have time to go after every single person that's not in compliance. And that creates a problem for the sewer plant as well because we're the ones having to clean up all of the stuff coming in. And if we're not in compliance, then we get fines. And so we really have to be on top of this issue. And a way of doing that is just regulating who the significant users are. Uh, so the 1316-450 is something that we already have in the books for our sewer ordinance and collecting fines or how to prosecute that. And so what I'm proposing is setting up the um, fines for violation at a maximum. So we have a first, second, and third maximum. And I know the numbers look high, but that is up to. And that would give us discretion to work with our smaller users and our larger users. So it doesn't mean that you know, your first violation, you're gonna be fined $2,500. That means if a really big user like Vandenberg did something really bad, that we would have 
something to threaten them with. Because if I were to say, oh, that's $100, that's nothing. They'd write us a check and continue doing what they wanted to do. So um, this really, it gives us a little more freedom to work with big business and small business as it pertains to um, violation and keeping us in our permit. Um, and then setting a particular fine for a certain violation would be really hard for us to enforce correctly because there are so many what have you's with each violation. So, um, you know, it could just be someone not getting their information in on time, or it could be someone dumping something hazardous down the drain. And, you know, for setting a fine for like your first offense, it doesn't really work. So that's why we want that little bit of leeway. So um, when it comes down to the money, um, if it passes, it isn't going to cost the city any money. It's just going to be taking in money that would be going to the wastewater fund. Um, this would help protect our existing infrastructure. I'm sure as many of you know, we have replaced the water treatment plant a couple years back and we want to keep that running for years to come. But if it's not being enforced and nobody's having to abide by the regulation, that's going to degrade quickly as well as the lines. Um, and it will also help, therefore, keeping sewer rates down. Because if we're not having to replace lines, if we're not having to replace equipment, then we're not having to get more money. Um, and if it doesn't pass the way it is right now, the city attorney is gonna have to continue with prosecuting anybody who is not in compliance. And by that same count, if we're not able to get at everybody, then we can be fined up to, or sorry, at a minimum of $3,000 a day for every day we're not in compliance. And we have been riding a fine line in a couple of our um, permitted amounts, like salts. Um, and then we wouldn't be, or er, then sewer cost could also raise as we have to replace things. Um, so here are our numbers right now. Our effluent for total dissolved solids is 997 milligrams per liter, and the basin plan is 1,000 milligrams per liter, and our permit says 1,100. So you can see how extremely close that is right there to a fine. We do get audited by the EPA, and they look at that, and that is a fine automatically if we exceed that. Chloride is pretty close there as well, and sodium. And sodium has been a bit of an issue for us lately. And are there any questions? Councilmember Mosby. Yeah, where's the sodium coming from? Sorry, what? Where is the sodium coming from? So sodium comes from a few different places. One of the biggest things that we do have in our current ordinance is we don't allow self-regenerating water softeners. But that doesn't mean that people aren't still using self-regenerating water softeners. We are trying to work with somebody right now who is putting a lot of salt into the system to get them to stop doing that. And so it's a matter of us finding it and then correcting it. Do we use sodium in our processing at the water plant? Um, at the water plant? I'm not sure about that. Um, I think Robert or Julie might know. Yeah, come, from, come forward to the microphone. Oh, Doran says no. Julie Moore, a chemist at the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, Doran just said no, so I'm assuming not. I, I don't know their process personally um, since I don't work there, but. Okay. Um, can you give, give me an example of a violation that you know of that's causing the lines to need to be replaced earlier? Um, yeah, so corrosives, um, pH, and grease and um, stuff like that, that causes issues with our lines. Do you have an example of a, a violation that we've gone through that we've? I am pretty new to this position, 
So I haven't really gone through a whole lot of that yet, but um, Good evening. I'm Robert Archer, the acting plant superintendent for the wastewater plant of the city of Lompoc. Just to give you some idea of the scale of this, that number up there that was uh, 997, I believe, that's our average number for a 12 month period. What that means is there's, uh, I believe the number was 982, 982 pounds of salts, chlorides, and so forth are dumped into the sewer for every million pounds of water. And that, uh, if you do the math on that, you find out that last year we were putting 27,000 pounds a day of these minerals into the environment. So those are coming through our pipes. So it's a very large problem. Our limit is excuse me, our limit is 27,500. We were putting in 24,569. So we're very close to going over the city's limit on what we as a city are allowed to put back into the environment after treatment. And these types of things, as you know, salt can be a corrosive. It causes cars to, to rot. So if we can control these things, it will help us meet our requirements as a city. So that's why we have the pretreatment program in place. So that, and we do have uh, some users who are up to four times over the limit they're allowed. And it may not seem like a lot for one person or one place, but when you add it all up, it adds up to those 25,000 pounds a day. So that's why we're concerned, the state is concerned, the uh, federal government, EPA is concerned, and we've been put under mandate and we have a permit for us to maintain. And that was the fining system that was spoken about by uh, Katrina here, that we as a city will face. So it's our feelings that if an individual is putting significant numbers in and violating, that that individual should be encouraged through monetary incentives, i.e. fines, to take care of that problem rather than the entire city and all the residents absorbing those costs for persons who are going over the limit. As a result of those, back in the day, the city council passed laws against self-regenerating water softeners, which use salt. And as mentioned, we still have some using that, some commercial businesses who use that. And we want to be able to enforce the ordinances that are already there. And currently, there's no fine system involved. We would like to ask the city council to implement a system of finding by which we have a zero up to a maximum and they can be placed as it's felt appropriate depending on the level of cooperation we get to meet our environmental goals. Okay, you, so I, what you got is the answer to my question is there's some people that are using water softeners still. That's yes. kind of what I was looking for. Now as far as TDS and total pounds of salts in there, and our water already coming out of the ground has probably about 1,200 part per million TDS to 1,400, and our water plant does a great job of bringing it down. Yes. So granted, with, with people just using the bathroom, you're going to get the water level up a little bit. Yes, um, so we're able to remove some at the wastewater treatment plant, but that water that we discharge also goes back into replenishing the wells and downstream users, so it affects them. So in effect, upstream users and downstream users by discharging these types of uh, constituents, we call them, can raise the drinking water levels. And so it's a circular problem that can, over time, get worse. Could, do you have a number of how many violations have occurred in the last five years? We don't. Sorry. Actually. A problem with that is there hasn't been somebody consistently in this position for quite some time. And so it hasn't been readily enforced. And as a result, there haven't been violations. There, we do have significant users that have been in violation and we do have a contract with an expert to help us get in line with what we need according to the EPA. And we should have been finding people all along and we haven't been. And that is something that if the EPA were to actually check into, we could be in trouble for. Okay, so I'm just trying to wrap around what, how big of a 
thing we're doing here, whether we're going to have 100 people or 1,000 people. What is the, what are you going after? I mean, I've heard. My goal is not to find people. Uh, my goal is to um, guide people into compliance. And then if they flat out refuse, that's when fines happen. So um, as far as violations, um, for example, the place that we're working with right now with all the salt, we have been working with them. Um, we sent them two letters, we have had meetings, we've had emails and phone calls, and we're, I gave them a really long window to come into compliance. So we're doing all we can. Okay, and then, you know, some of the questions the public asked here, uh, you know, would a car leaking oil be, be a violation, to be a stormwater violation, is it something as well that you'd be looking at that you're, I'm no. not stormwater. Okay, That's so you're Stacey's just... bag. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, the another question from the public was: uh, Would we potentially be going after some of our other partners in the wastewater plant, meaning Vanderburg Air Force Base, or Vanderburg's one of our permitted significant users? Um, they're already. In but if they were in violation, if they were in violation with with some of these TDS requirements or or anything else that you saw there? Would that be something that you would put a fine towards uh, yes. towards our partners? Okay. Yes. And what mechanism right now? I and mean, we have ability to go through legal, right? We have a we have a due process to go through legal on on any of these right now. Um, right now, we do, um, but it is it's time consuming, and it is it's a process instead of being able to grab people's attention uh, when the issue is happening, this, it's something that's gonna take months and they can continue violating until something's brought forth. So if they're putting something in the sewer system that they shouldn't be, then it's gonna take a while before we can stop it. It's, I mean, how, how long of a time for the city attorney maybe could answer? How long of a time is it to go through a process? If somebody's violating, how long would it take for you to stop somebody who's violating? I guess it all depends on how good their attorney is. <laughs> um, it could take six months, and that's probably quick. And how short of a time? Six months is the quick time. I, I, I mean, if you, you couldn't do one in 30 days? I could file something in 30 days, but I'd have to be filing in court, and we'd have to go through the court system. Okay. Okay. Which is the point of the administrative fine, so we sure. don't need to take that. Approach. And I'm just trying to wrap around everything we're trying to do here and answer some of the questions that the public house as well asked. Um, and if one I of the can just add, in my nine years here, I've never been asked to do it because the staff understands the process is very difficult to use. Okay. The, the other thing that concerned me is you made a statement that you would adjust your fining on whether somebody was big or small and that concerns me that you can lead toward a potential of well this person has more money so I'm going to find them more this person has less money I'm going to find them less you know, I, I just think we have to be cautious when we're uh, going to look at fines by the size of somebody's wallet right and it's not just me making these decisions it's going to be the utility director so it's you know not just on one person's shoulder it's going to be a few people and um, you know I don't want to put anyone out of business so adjusting that I think is crucial is you know a fine for like Raytheon or Vandenberg isn't going to be the same for a small business I wouldn't want to hit them with that so that's going to put people out huh. I, I hear you on that but I just don't want to lead to a point where you're, you're somebody is feeling discriminated against because they're doing the same violation, but their wallet's bigger than this person, so they're gonna get a bigger fine than that person. I just. The, the adjustment comes in not by the amount of money a person has, but by the amount of the, the I, I guess I should say, the egregiousness of the violation. So a small violation is not going to elicit the same kind of fine as a very large and potentially costly violation to the city. In other words, we'll still have to pay the fines if we exceed our limits whether we collect okay. or not. That's, that's yeah. why I wanted for the record yeah. is here because the way it was kind of going on before is, okay, thank you. Anyone else? Just, oh, Councilor Starbuck. I know it was mentioned somewhere in the report here, but 
Are we ever going to be in a circumstance where it would be cheaper to pay the fine than it would be to fix the problem? Um, I, I'm not 100% sure on that, but at the fine starting at a minimum of $3,000 a day, that... I don't think we'll be in that position then. Huh? <laughs> Anyone else? Ms. Dorsey, thank you. Um, I know this is the first time presenting before the City Council. You did a great job, so... Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to open this up to the public. Hello, Charles Supper. Um, as most of you know, my mother owns a restaurant, and a letter came in about a survey, and she gave it to me. I took it to my business, the building owner, and ultimately I decided that um, most everything on the survey was non-applicable. Um, the building doesn't have a gas line. We don't have a grill. We don't have um, a deep fryer. We do zero grease cooking at all. And um, I was told a employee came into the business. My mother felt blindsided. Um, interrogated and she now has a letter telling her she's going to be fined for not having a grease trap that um, I don't believe is necessary at all in this establishment. Um, we, we heat to serve and there's very, very minimal grease at that. It's just pastrami and most of that grease that we have from that goes into the trash and not the sewer system. So I would like to see something done as far as um, the letter, the violation, and maybe a little bit more investigation into whether it's actually necessary to have a grease trap. Because it sounds like the only thing that happened was an, um, sort of a, a questioning of what the business is without seeing any grease of any sort um, going into the sewage system and she can't pay that fine and the grease trap is unnecessary. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next, please. Good evening, John Lynn, Utility Commissioner. So I, my first comment is, once again, the staff has bypassed the Utility Commission and brought this to you. And it's clear, that, as you've sat here and talked about this, that it's a very complex issue, and there are an awful lot of questions that need to be asked. Um, thinking back to when I was mayor, I recall one issue where we had someone whose grease interceptor wasn't working right, and they were plugging up a very long lateral that happened to belong to the city. And that's the only one that I was ever involved in in the four years I was mayor. Um, you have to ask yourself if we go out to all the delicatessens and the ice cream stores and why not beauty shops, I mean they, they, I'm sure they run some hair down the drain, and we ask them all to put in a, uh, a cheap grease interceptor is about 400 bucks for an under sink unit and one in the ground is six to ten thousand dollars. Is that business friendly, and, and is that truly going to benefit our system? And for that matter, would every winery that serves a little food need to have a grease interceptor? How about churches and fraternal organizations that have potlucks and wash out dishes in the sink? And these are just a few of the questions that you'll need to be asking. But I think. You appoint us to ask those questions and to qualify all this before it comes to you and give you a recommendation. So I would hope that this evening your effort here would be to forward it to us so that we can do the job that you've hired us to do and provide you with better information. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next, please. Seeing no one rise, we're gonna bring back to the council. Would some discussion? Motion? Motion. 
Okay. Um, I move to accept staff recommendation to introduce ordinance number 161618 for the first reading. Okay, do I have a second? No, I had discussion. Okay, I will second that motion. Now you can have a discussion. Um, being a former restaurant owner, I can see that some of the fines are obtrusive. I see with the environment, I see that it can be a benefit with violations, but as the city attorney said in the nine years he's been here, there hasn't been a precedence that he had to be involved in one of these litigation items. So it seems to me that it looks like it's revenue generating and it's not gonna be business conducive at this time uh, to any businesses wanting to come in with all the restrictions here. I can tell you as uh, through my experience and through the implementation of their inspection process, there are times where um, you'd be asked for paperwork to substantiate whatever you did and then you send the paperwork in and they, it, it, it's a process from which someone has to show up personally to actually look at it afterwards when uh, paperwork is already in compliance, uh, you would think that that would be sufficient. So I think that it's probably an overreach as far as the fine system. I think uh, business, being business friendly also is up to us to control our fee schedule and our fine schedule. I think that yes, it can generate fines and it's a tool from which to put teeth in just like every other staff recommendation that comes up here. But at this time we're looking at kind of controlling our business environment, really creating a, an environment which is business friendly instead of just wishing and saying it. I think some of our actions are gonna be looked at by other people out here on TV and in the public. And I think you would expect us to, to make sure that we have that window of opportunity and relative uh, uh, measure of success for our businesses instead of uh, feeling the, the pressure. We've had several businesses closed lately, as people have noted, and you know what, what the statistics are that restaurants usually and within five years fold if they don't have some sort of capital or some sort of sustainability issue here, and I hate to be that person that put that pressure on them. Councilmember Mosby. Yeah, I'd be willing to make a substitute motion that this document go back in front of the utility commission for further review um, and go through there and, and bring it back to us after they make their decision on on potentially more public comment and, and more input from them. I'll give you a second. Okay, so we'll first have to vote to see if we want to vote on this substitute motion. So um, all in favor of voting on the substitute motion? Uh, yeah, let's vote. That passes 3-2. Okay, so we'll hear the substitute motion. You've made a motion, seconded. Uh, discussion? Okay, let's vote. Okay, pass 3-2. So it's going back to the uh, Utility Commission. And I understand it'll probably be coming back to us at some point. Okay, that brings us to written communication. Oh, oh wait. Nine. Number nine. I told you I'm in a hurry to get out of here. Okay. I know you're trying. <laughs> I know. Okay, number nine, adoption of resolution 6229, parentheses 18, approving a second supplemental appropriation for funding for riverbed cleanup. Okay. Mr. Troop. Thank you, Mayor and Council. And I'm, I'm going to be asking um, the police chief and Stacy Lawson to join me. They have more backup information. I, I'm asking them also to give a little bit of a little bit of a backup, little color to what's going on with the uh, the riverbed cleanup. As I mentioned earlier, we're up to 725,000 pounds of trash, much more than we anticipated when we first started. We are we came up first, asked for funding. It was approximately 532,000 dollars. Um, Again, a lot of work has been done down there. We're getting close to what we think will be final, um, but we are needing to ask for additional funds. What was in the staff report was what we were guessing at that moment because we hadn't got hold of the contractor to know how far along is he 50% still, is he 80% still? So Stacy has some of these updated numbers, so it is a lesser number than the 450. Um, but there is the the need to finish this project. We're very close to finishing it according to the contractor. Um, there are dates involved and Stacy can get into that about February 1st being the nesting season. So we have to stop every activity down there. Um, but it is, a, it is a request for some additional funding but it won't be the $450,000 that was there. So you want Stacy first? Okay, we'll have Stacy go first. We have a question first, Mr. Oh. Drew. Yeah, come for Starbucks. 
I, I guess the, the basic question here is, is, is anybody else kicking down money on this? That's been the promise, or, or you know, the, what we've been hoping, but. So this, the county just, and I, I lost track if they've already had their meeting or they're going to be having it. They, we sent them down our emergency declaration. They're taking that one forward. Um, I will be sending out an invoice to the county. I haven't heard back yet on that for this cost. Um, we just had another Sacramento City just had some state funds given to them for their cleanup. So I'm going to be reaching out to Sacramento to say, who did you talk to up there? But Sacramento being Sacramento and the capital right there, they might have had. Some I insight. guess my biggest concern here would be is if this is approved now, we're at almost a million dollars. And all of a sudden, our emergency ordinance is not needed anymore. So then we would lose our leverage for the funding, and they would just go, oh, well, they're already done. So it. We're still, I mean, I, we're working as quickly as we can to try and get somebody to, to help us out. I was going to reach back out. I sent out things to our letters uh, to Cunningham, and I just lost her name, just blanked on that. Senate, Senator Verhan Beth Jackson. That's the one. Thank you. Um, I had not heard anything back from those two, so I'm going to be reaching out to them again. The county did say they're going forward with a, the agenda item, so I'm hoping that will be their first part of it. Um, our uh, board of supervisor here for our district, his chief of staff has said in public that the county needs to do their share. So. Uh, that's one of the things I'll be talking about to the county about that one. So I'm hoping they'll come forward, but I'm also going to be reaching out to the state once I can find who that individual was that the state of, or city of Sacramento used. And I guess the last question I'd have is funding for enforcement. I mean, you, we were talking at 300 and some thousand dollars for fire police to go and, and, and check the daily checks on the river. Is this going to continue? I mean, we're going to want to continue it, but is there going to be money available for those agencies, or are we going to wind up paying for all of that also when most of it is their property, not ours? That'll be a discussion, you know, that it, we'll have to get with the mayor or the, the board of supervisors and discuss that because it, it is that where the city owns the property, it sits in the county's jurisdiction. Who's in charge? Um, we have heard that there's not enough sheriff's officers to police it. It is our city property. So we're, we're trying to get to that point, almost like a mediation, if you will, on who's responsible for what. Yeah, I mean, My we're, view is... We're the providing the officers. Exactly. And, you know. Yeah. Councilman Mosby. Yeah. Question for a member of the public head here is, to date, uh, has anybody been prosecuted for what's going on down there? Ticketed or what have you? Um, all of our trespassing arrests, most of them have been dismissed by the judge uh, here. Uh, the public defender, um, you know, she'll come in with her staff and try and, and, and leverage that arrest for the clients, but we haven't had any prosecution. And, and quite frankly, what, what we were hoping for was, you know, it's a low-grade misdemeanor. They're probably not going to send them to jail, but we were hoping they would use the arrest to leverage them into treatment or housing or point them towards services. So uh, we're still trying to work that out. This is a new judge, and our relationship hasn't coalesced. I mean, we have a great relationship. But we just don't have that working relationship just yet. Is the ability, if, if you catch somebody down there in one of these camps, that maybe the judge can say, hey, your responsibility is to clean up that camp? Well, I, I don't know if this judge would do that. Judge Flores that just retired probably would have. He was a bit of a, a expert in this area. So, uh, but, you know, when I come up, I'm gonna give a, an update what, what I'm thinking about doing going forward, unless you want it just right now. Yeah, so uh, one of the things that we've, we don't need to give notice anymore. Everybody knows you can't be in the river. So uh, the, I talked to the Sheriff's Department, they're not willing to give us a deputy. Uh, they. You know, so we, we are, we're policing in their jurisdiction. We understand that. So uh, uh, Lemos Feed Store and uh, Rob Klug from Master Repair uh, bought us a trailer that we could pull behind our uh, off-road vehicle. So when we come upon a camp, if they're there, we'll give them an opportunity to pack up and leave. If they're not there, we will pack their stuff up and leave a notice on a stake saying, if you want your property, it's in my property room. Because I don't think we have to wait anymore. Well, we don't. 
we don't have to wait anymore for that. Uh, we won't throw anything away. We'll keep it. They can come get it. But if we continue, if we we need to get back into the river, we haven't been able to do do that because I just have one officer, and it's just not safe to go in the river with without uh, without a partner. But we're working on a mission to do that. Mr. Mosby, you have more questions? Yeah, I'd went for the, the city manager. Uh, maybe the chief could answer. Well, I don't know who. Uh, uh, right below the the shelter, there was a camp there in the willow trees, and I noticed that it seemed like the same team that was cleaning up the riverbed. Are, are we paying for that to be cleaned up over there? So actually, I'll have Stacy answer that because I just talked to her about okay. that situation. All right. Council? Mayor? Um, this afternoon, I became aware of a situation when the biologist emailed me photographs. I asked, you know, where was the forester working in the last couple of days? And so I got photographs of uh, certain areas, and one of them was very interesting. Um, it was a photograph of some vegetation that was located east and right against Caltrans right away um, of Sweeney. And it's not our property. It's, as far as I can tell, nowhere close to our property, and I don't know why they were there. And so I called and asked around, and thus far we're still looking into how did they get there? Why were they doing this? I understand there was an encampment there, but that doesn't mean their instructions have been to stay on city property and deal with city encampments only. Um, so we're gonna be looking into that, and also I'm working on working with the contractors to cost out what that particular aspect of it cost. And they said they spent about a half day, so we'll get some numbers. There was a crew there again today picking up. Okay, well they've been advised that's not a, an approved location at this point, that we, you know, it's outside of city property. I got some photos for you. But just a question, so I guess the answer is yes, they seem to be migrating other directions a little bit. I think, I think that you know, for whatever reason, they found an encampment and felt it needed to be taken care of, but um, we're working with them on that. Right, thank you. Question. Um, Councilman Vega. Uh, Mr. Troop, uh, Jim, does it seem like in a partnership where we seem that we've declared an emergency and we've um, deemed that it's not all our property and we're running faster than our partners, it seems to me that we're in a, in a, in a weaker position right here to get any funding from potential people who have not responded here. So. I'm sure you've thought about it, so I'm just asking a question here that says, hey, so we use up all this money that's in the water fund, and all of a sudden they say they're going to throw us a hundred bucks. Um, what happens in that case? Have you guys thought about this, that we may be going in, a time, in an untimely manner in order to facilitate our end, but we're not actually referencing our partnerships, uh, we don't have approval yet to go. You know, it should be, there should be a relative percentage of buy-in depending on responsibility, I believe. It sounds like you haven't had any responses. They don't want to put, they don't want to throw in. The, the original response from the county was that they were going to be a partner in this. And that was started with the triage center and then it's slowly faded. So I will be reaching out to, the, to them. I've been re reaching out to the CAO, county administrative officer, plus her second in command. Um, to try and get this going forward. I've been in touch with Bob Nelson, Peter Adams, uh, with the Chief of Staff, trying uh, to get that going because, you know, there, there was that initial piece saying, yeah, this, we need to do this. I've had Pete, or Bob say in, in a public session at the last Board of Supervisors meeting say this is the city or the county's responsibility also, not just the city. So they are reluctant because I think part of it is they don't want to open that box and then have every other city come forward saying there's an issue. But um, when we looked at it, I think with Stacy, you looked at how much all the cities had spent for cleanups. I, you know, the, the next highest was Santa Barbara, but they were all, you know, $30,000, $50,000, because they didn't have this issue. So it, it is disturbing that we aren't getting that 
feedback that we need. And now that the election is over for both the state elected officials, I really am expecting something, and, and not just expecting waiting, I'll be reaching out again to them to say, hello, I'm calling, please pick up my phone. Yeah, I would think that there's a concern because of all the effort that the city of Lompoc has made in moving forward. It's a great effort by the police and the fire and everyone else, so I'm applauding the effort. I'm just concerned with the outlay of capital here, and we got budget coming up, and we have all this, and we have other needs, and, and uh, we can't reference any of them, and so it seemed like the partnership aspect of it would be great. I think if I had a partner that told me to go pay up front and we'll pay you back later, I don't think that'd be a very good partnership. Well, we so were, I think that we're in a weak position. We, we were in a less than desirable position because we had to get this done. The other one that bothers me is a majority of these people down there were not from Lompoc, so you know, we are servicing other people and servicing them by the means of cleaning up after the the trash that was left over. So those other areas from the people where they've, you know, one lady I met down there um, graduated from Buellton High School seven or eight years ago. It wasn't from Lompoc. So, yeah. you know, no, I got you. I, I, and I appreciate it again, but I have to ask these questions because Fine. the county has to be watching this on TV and knows how much money's in the water fund. and. And uh, so it makes sense that they're playing little hokey pokey over there, but we need them to buy in because we're moving forward faster than I think we should be yeah. uh, as far as uh, spending. I think we're running at an emergency pace when most of it's been accomplished. We got them out of the riverbed. We've already done a relative amount of cleanup. And now it's about a finish, but where's the partnership? Yeah. Thank you. I would like Stacy to come up and- Sure, of course. And I, your... While she's coming up, I just want to make one comment. Um, if you um, continue to respond or mm -hmm. request information or help from both our um, assembly member and our state senator and get nothing, I found that working with Northern California Power, elected official to elected official often gets results faster. Unfortunately, I'm not discrediting your position, right. but you may want to prepare a letter from the city council. Jill, connect me if, I'm, if I can't do this, but letter from the city council and have it from the city council and go out to them instead of just from you. So. Okay. Okay, city attorney? It, it would be best if it just came from one or two council people because you may want to reword it and, and you, you sure, work okay. on the wording, you need to do that in public session. So, okay, so the mayor and the vice mayor signing it or something. Well, we'll have a new mayor in two days, so maybe that'll work, so. Um, but suggesting if you don't get any results, quick. Okay. Ms. Lawson. Thank you. Um, as a part of preparing for the meeting, I went ahead and contacted each of the contractors. At this time, we have three contractors that we're working with. One is the operator of the forester, and one is the biologist that goes along with him <coughs> to identify those plants that can be um, taken out. Uh, and. The other is the cleanup contractor. Now the cleanup contractor, the estimate that we had in the staff report was trying to be conservative, but at the same time, the contractor had said, well, we're gonna need to work until the end of the you know, year, month of December, and they're running about $50,000 a week. And so adding that up, you got some pretty big numbers. Um, I checked in today and I had a surprise when the contractor said, you know, we're um, a little surprised ourselves, but we're getting close. And so in the next, you know, maybe by the end of the week or maybe by the beginning of next week, we will be done with everything that we've found. Now that is, recently we have found a number of new uh, sites as a result of using the forester. Now, the forester takes out the coyote brush and then you can see all kinds of things. So things that were not known before, but the contractor has cleaned those up too. It doesn't mean that there aren't more out there. So the proposal that we have at this point is let the contractor finish the cleanup contractor and then keep the forester uh, continuing work until the end of January and possibly either one, doing one, exposing new sites um, so that we know what we have to clean up, 
and two, allowing for a more open landscape with the last coyote brush, which allows for better um, enforcement by the police. So uh, we came up with some alternative um, proposals. One thing that might have been mentioned previously is that um, there is a desire on the part of a lot of different city departments to obtain a Forester because it's such a fabulous vehicle um, with, uh, you know, it's very effective. And we have a lot of coyote brush. Um, the biologist today, when I was talking with him, he said, you know, this is just old bean farm grown over with coyote brush. It's not really significant habitat per se, it's upland. Um, and so it's not a big deal comparatively to the impact of the homeless um, living outside of normal standards um, to take it out and make this much more open area. So we came up with two estimates. One is, and they're much different than the 450,000, I think, in the staff report. Uh, the first one would include uh, the cleanup contractor finishing um, and finishing this week, beginning next week, depending upon how many days, given that there's now a holiday. Um, also, the forester and the operator, and the forester and the operator continuing through the end of January. The biologist continuing with him through the end of January, and this um, cleanup of Migalito Creek, which is an, something we do every year. So with all of that, the additional funds that we would need to complete that would be $24,000. Um, then we looked at the possibility. Can I, can I, you said for two more weeks, you saying, but you said it's $50,000 a week. For, for that the, the a cleanup week or work. less. It's, they told me maybe by the end of this week and that my estimate includes the end of this week. So it, I'm not sure where the two more weeks came in because it's really not two more weeks. It's either the end of this week or an additional day. So the estimate is pretty close to 385 um, for the cleanup contractor total on this cleanup. Um, and then that would also, the forester um, would continue with the biologist in this proposal until the end of January, allowing us to clear out as much brush as we can legitimately before we would have to have the biologist start looking for nesting birds um, and 500 feet of buffer area that you couldn't touch. So that becomes ineffective. Um, then with the Forester uh, purchase of a possible purchase of a used Forester as an option, we same pricing for the cleanup contractor to finish the um, piece work and the purchase of the Forester and training or part time of an operator and the biologist to go with them and the standard Mingolito Creek cleanup comes out at 40,000 additional um, dollars as opposed to the 450. So it's a lot different, uh, primarily based on the fact that the contractor suddenly got to the point where, gosh, they think it's clean. Um, Officer Calderon is going out to verify that it is clean and that they have gotten to the areas that he's aware of because he's most familiar. And so, you know, with his agreement, I think that we can be pretty confident that they have gotten to all of the uh, materials that we're aware of at this time. Thank you, and are there questions? I have a question. Council Member Starbuck. Yeah, when is the nesting season? February 1st to what? Uh, it, it varies, it's like February 1st to usually like the 15th of September. So the only reason we would look at buying the Forester now then would be to do Magalita Creek because we're not going to be allowed back in the riverbed until September or whatever sometime. Not necessarily. 
Um, because the forester, if we were to uh, utilize the forester and purchase a forester ourselves, then we would release the contractor with the forester at this time and then move forward in developing our own forester program, which could be used not only in the riverbed. It really wouldn't be appropriate for Megaletta Creek, um, but it would be used in the riverbed. It could be used on airport property. It could be used on uh, parks properties. Um, so there are many other ways that we could use the Forester to help our park staff in maintenance and those types of things. A little off subject, but do we maintain the flood control ditches? We do. Uh, East West Channel, we do. Uh, the county maintains V Street. That, that would be another one that they could actually drive it along with the tracks. It's got a very six foot wide mower rather than crews going out there. One person could drive it. Councilmember Vega. Um, Stacy, I think you answered one of my questions that if we purchase the Forester, you'd relieve the current operator, but you still have to keep the biologist, right? Is that a biologist Correct. that's on staff or is that a contractor? That is a contractor, it's a local contractor. And the numbers that I heard, maybe you can re-clarify here, was 385, I heard you mention that number, uh, 40 and 24. And maybe you could kind of just clarify again and what the savings would be if we purchased okay. the Forester versus the total amount that's being asked, which is 450. Okay, now it's hard for me to calculate what the savings would be. Because no, I got you, I got yeah. you. Just come close, give me a ballpark of the what we're doing. The difference between the two is 24,000 for the continuing with the contractors, we have them. Okay. This would still leave the option open in the future of your purchasing a Forester and having somebody trained to operate it. Um, the second option would be an additional 40000 and that would assume that we would uh, cease our contract currently with the Forester operator and then go forward in purchasing our own Forester and training someone to use it. Um, so they wouldn't be able to take over this job because it would take training? I'm not sure how long the training would take, right. maybe a day or two. It's not... Gotcha. I don't know that it would be that difficult. We also have some people on staff who operate similar um, machines. And so the other factor as far as the savings, while well, there is a difference between the two numbers of 40000 and 24000 um, the savings of purchasing a Forester might be long term because of the benefits that you're going to get from making it easier to police areas and the benefits that you're going to get for more effective maintenance of parks and uh, east west channel and those kind of things that thing works really fast gotcha. and um, so long term there might be significant savings so there was a larger number there did i hear that correctly the larger number is forty thousand that was the largest number, but we're asking it. We have a $450,000 ask, right? Up to. But you're saying the numbers have now changed and they're yes. quite a bit less, is what That's you're correct. saying. So we're That's talking correct. about 40 and 24 instead yes. of 450, but you're still proposing that we approve 450, but you're going to spend less. Is that what it no. is? No. Okay, so that number's changing the for the yes, ask. You have the option to approve 40. 24 you could go up to 450 yeah i got you man. yes we can time, i got you i got you that um you know you could consider the 40 or the 24. gotcha you're a good negotiator but i got you now <laughs> thank you anyone else okay thank you miss lawson we'll open this up to the public Gary Cox, 58-year resident of Lompoc and uh, current business owner of 34 years. Uh, I'm not sure how much money is going to quick response your cleanup contractor, but my point of being here is not to challenge giving them more money, is that two months ago when you presented uh, the staff report, you didn't include a local contractor who does the exact same things, environmental hazmat cleaning, all the certificates, state certified, uh, contractor board approved, and he was not given a chance. So I would just like to say next time you guys and staff have something brought to you, try to support the local small business. 
This business has 55 employees. They would have spent that $385,000 in Lompoc after they got paid. That money would have, a lot of it would have come back to Lompoc. And this guy didn't even get a chance to bid on the job. And it's Olivera's restoration. He's been in business since 1972. And I just think that's a slap in the face to small business. We have a hard enough time getting by. And when your local city and government doesn't support you, I think that's wrong. So next time something comes up or if there's further cleanup, you should bring them into the loop or at least publish it in the paper so someone else will have a chance that's local to bid on it. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Anyone else? Oh, Mr. Trude. Thank you. Um, I am a local business and I appreciate the work that I do for the city of Lompoc and you citizens as well. My question would be is there's millions of dollars available through the state and federal government for situations that arise in grant money. Do we have somebody in the city of Lompoc that's capable of accessing those grants and instead of using water money, would it be more prudent of us to try and go for grant money to solve these problems versus water money? That would be my question. And uh, I think I have a friend of mine that writes grants in Tulare County and texts me constantly about occasional grants that come up for different things. Some of these are environmental stuff. So that would be my question. I think there's money available without using our resources to help this is not our problem, and it didn't happen overnight. I think there's got to be a way that we can take care of it without exhausting our funds. Because the only thing that's going to happen is higher water, sewer, utility rates, right? And we've been going through that for, well, I've been here 50 years. Oh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Troop, you had a comment? You're good? Okay. Uh, Charles Summer, Parks and Recreation Commissioner. I would err on the caution of buying equipment. As a commissioner, I've seen parks purchase equipment that were not ready to utilize correctly. I honestly believe that the top dresser was uh, the wrong purchase um, for a much higher price than was necessary, is not utilized enough, and the city should go through a full vetting process before purchasing the Forester, uh, making sure, I mean, which staff member is going to run it because parks run similar um, probably operating systems, but are there enough parks employees to run the system in the riverbed? Is it going to be urban forestry who's also um, low staffed? I mean, there's a lot of different areas of the city that are staffed very minimally and who's going to run it? What's the maintenance cost of it? Sure, the upfront cost is going to be less than whatever else it is, but I, before you go and put another big piece of equipment at the yard, know if you've got the space, know if you've got the personnel, and you've got to know long-term cost on just maintenance of that machine because are you going to hire another contractor to come out and fix a machine that someone doesn't know how to fix? So, thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Okay, seeing no one rise, we're going to close public comment, bring it back to the council. Discussion? Motion? Councilman Mosby. If the city manager could just break it down one more time. Options. What you're looking for. So the, the 20, so again, the 450,000, that was when we had to do the staff report, we had to pick something and we didn't know how far the contractor had gotten. So for this one to continue on sort of status quo as it is, just to finalize everything, is $24,000. So that's keeping the contractor who does the trash cleanup right now just the next few days, but keeping the forester going um, longer through the end of January. So that's that extra 24,000. Second option would be if we were to purchase the Forester, um, that would be $40,000 versus the 24 that we just mentioned. So it would have the continuation of the cleanup contractor, just that little piece there, the purchase of the Forester, um, and then uh, you know, a very small amount of training that would go on there. 
the continuation of the biologist, and then we still have to do the cleanup of Miguelito, which was in both option one and two. So the, the big difference is um, the purchase of the Forester. I, I think, the, didn't it say 85,000 for the purchase of the Forester? That's what you have in the staff report, so that would have been on top of the 40,000? Actually, we um, estimated high on the purchase of Forester for this estimate at 90,000, and we also included 50,000 for operator, part-time, whatever additional costs there might be associated with having the Forester. Because the, the Forester to run it with the current process is about 86 plus thousand dollars through the end of January. So it's just an offset of running it with the rental or buy it out, right? Okay, so we have is it three options, 24,000, 40,000, and 85,000 or no, 90,000 no, no. or no. what? So 24,000, which includes keeping this Forester, which is the, the brush hog or however you want to. The, the rental, the, the, the people doing it. Yeah. So they own it, they come out, they manage it and run it. That's the $24,000 option, which is in there. The other one is, instead of having them do it, we buy the Forester, so it's a little bit more. We have down 90,000, just in case that's going through quickly. You can find some low hours, uh, used ones, not brand new by any means. And uh, so the offset is, is minimal on that one, but we did add some additional cost because um, you buy the equipment for that, but then we'd have to ha pay for someone in the city, be it if they're from water, wastewater, streets, airport, they would have to be compensated via a transfer. So that was that difference there. I'm trying to wrap around. So you want 24,000 or 90,000? No, no, 24,000, keep it as it is, just okay. to get us through right. with no changes. 40,000 gets us where we buy the actual um, Forester machine. But the only thing we would be adding would really be um, training of the operator and then using the operator, which is our own operator, it's our own employee, but then we would have to pay that employee if they're coming from parks, but they're doing stormwater, they, we gotta pay out of stormwater, so it's that funding there. It's, so it's almost the same, we just buy the piece of equipment and we use our own person to run it. And that extra is the person running it. All right. Councilmember Vega. Uh, do we need to go to public comment first or, or have we already done that? We've done public comment. We've done public comment. I'd like to make a motion that we move forward in a frugal manner uh, by proposing that we approve the 24,000. If we get more appropriations from the county as far as a buy-in, then we take a second look um, but for now, I think we should take the more reserved uh, direction uh, by looking out for the people's uh, money. So that's my motion. Okay. Do we have a second? I'll second. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? M Mr. Mayor, may I yes. just ask for clarification? There's a resolution that's being adopted. It's resolution 6229. And right now the resolution shows a $450,000 amount. So is, is, is what's being suggested is change that to $24,000? Yes, sir. I'd like to re restate that, that we're changing it from $450,000 to the $24,000, sir. Yes. That would be my... And you're adopting resolution number 6229. But not 450, yes. Okay. Clarif okay. Any other discussion? Let's vote. And passes five zero. Okay, thank you. And now, written communications. Nothing more than you've already received. <laughs> okay, oral communication. This is your opportunity to speak to us for up to two minutes on any item that can come before this council. I'm Charles Summer. I want to express my uh, disappointment that the city has opted to close down tomorrow. Um, I use the word opted because it's not required. The city of Santa Barbara is still going to be open. The county of Santa Barbara is still going to be open. And it is closing down facilities that are used daily, uh, specifically the Lompoc Aquatic Center. I am a coach for the club swim team. I am a supporter of athletics. 
and Cabrillo girls water polo had to move their game. Um, my practice has been canceled and regular users that have already paid for lessons for their children are going to be out one of the eight sessions that they get for their um, whatever financial point they make. I encourage the city to encourage or encourage council to encourage the city to uh, reverse that action and just open up the aquatic center for tomorrow. And then my uh, second thing is I've been working with Pat Walsh, at least not necessarily specifically, but um, I've been trying to set up a meeting with Walsh or one of his officers about how to mitigate the um, violations of that have been happening at the skate park. Um, I've called a couple times, one resulted in some arrests and I've been pushing as a Parks and Recreation Commissioner to get lights out at the skate park. I think lights would mitigate crime. It's proven lights mitigate crime and it would take kids that are out running around doing whatever, staying at the skate park, um, which is a healthy activity. It's an Olympic sport now and we should embrace that park that we have a little bit more. It was originally, in the original resolution, it was supposed to be lighted for funding reasons it was not. There are over a million dollars in impact fees that could um, easily be reallocated to put um, inexpensive lights that Ojai has or San Luis has. Ojai, it's quarter driven. You put a quarter in there, it lights out for a certain amount of time. I don't see this as an, a, a huge expense at the city and it mitigates crime and gives uh, the youth a little bit more time to have an activity that they enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next, please. Mayor, council members, members of the public, um, I'm concerned with the city of Lompoc website. I wanted to participate in public comment concerning the SureFresh project, which had a deadline of yesterday. I tried to do Google searches. I tried to use the city website to look up staff reports and certain things, which I used to have an ease of finding. I now go on Google and I'm given links that say that the website is no longer available, that the links no longer exist, that perhaps the I put it in wrong, perhaps uh, the city's website has changed, moved, or no longer exists. So it used to be quite easy to find the agenda on the city website, to download the agenda, to look at staff reports, to go back and look at previous city council meetings, including the YouTube channel that the city council meetings are located on. There is an order which starts, I believe, back in 2010 or 2014, which lists the council meetings in chronological order according to the date in which they were uh, had the meetings. And when you go down this list in chronological order, it's all good for a couple of years and then you start getting into a mixture of different things and it takes you all over the place and it becomes unreasonable for a person who has common knowledge of a computer to find information that is pertinent to public comment and I don't like it, I don't like the way that it's being designed and I, I know, understand that there's being changes that are made, but there is something wrong with it. Those changes need to be made more rapidly. Something needs to be done. It shouldn't be so difficult in order to find information that is readily available for the public previously, which is now difficult to do. Um, I was unable to participate in the public comment because I was unable to complete my research in order to complete my public comment and I am not too happy about that. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Okay, seeing no one rise, we're gonna close oral communication and go to council requests, comments, and meeting reports. Council Member Vega. Uh, nothing to report tonight, sir. Council Member Mosby. Yeah, if I can just make a comment, both our police and fire chief just left, but if I could just shout out to, well, Captain Joe, you're here, you know, and thank you guys for stepping up for, for you know, and the chiefs for the riverbed, both of the fire defense and what you've done down there uh, really have done a significant impact. It was hundreds of acres that you guys had to go through and your guys had to go through and it, with the minimalist of, of issues. So you guys really you know, should be commended, chiefs as well, 
for being there and all the people in there. Uh, you guys did a really good job there. I know it's not over yet, but uh, I, I've noticed a, a big difference. I want to thank you guys for all that. Um, with that as well, with something that came up while we were having this discussion on uh, the administrative finding process, uh, I had a number, you know, three people contact me about the grease interceptor component, and I was advised that um, that all grease, all restaurants, anything, anybody serving food, including ice cream shops, were going to have to have grease interceptors if they were generating grease or not. And uh, in looking at um, our code 13, 16, 370, traps and interceptors, is that the, the, the opinion of the director whether this interceptor is to be implemented? And I believe it needs to be a little bit more uh, direct or indirect. If somebody's not generating grease, they shouldn't have to put an interceptor in. But I've been told that no, if you're just having and serving food, you're going to have to put an interceptor in it. Where you really truly need it or not, because you might someday cook something. And I think as a council request, I'd like to have this come back, this, this component here for discussion to council, and get something that's a little tighter and not so opinionated. So with that, I did a second and a third. I'll give you a second if you're going to ask for it to come back within a certain time frame. Um, yeah, within on a, on a Tuesday night council meeting within 60 days. Not on a Sunday, of course. Yeah, my second, of course. Okay. Definitely a third on it. Okay. Councilman Mosby, anything else? That's it. Thank you. Okay. Councilman Starbuck. No reports. Councilman Rosborn. I attended a regional economic development event called Hourglass Project, and it is a regional examination of how to promote economic development, and the region runs from Lompoc all the way to Camp Roberts, and it includes two counties and ten cities, and so we should keep our eye on that development and however Lompoc can participate and be involved in that so that we're at the table rather than losing out to the competition that will develop from this organization um, coming to fruition. It'll probably take them about a year, but we should uh, make sure we're at the table as part of that discussion. And then I want to thank the Chamber for pulling together the Champ Lompoc Day. I usually use it as a way to finish my Christmas shopping, and I did so this year, so thanks again to the Chamber for organizing that. Nothing else to report. Okay, thank you. And I attended several meetings, but only one at city expense. I went to Roseville, Northern California Power Agency. I was there the 28th and the 29th. The city provided a motel room for me and paid mileage. I drove my own vehicle. And that's what I have to report. So if there's nothing else, this meeting is adjourned to a regular city council meeting, uh, 6.30 p.m. on Tuesday, December 18th. Thank you and good evening.